4.4 zettabytes. That pile of iPods would have taken us more or less to the moon. 2020, we can go to the moon and back at least eight times. And we suspect that this is a conservative estimate of quite how much data we're generating. And this is from the International Data Corporation. We are, of course, expanding this data through the various ways of collection. We heard in the introduction from some of the speakers about uh, remote sensing, satellite, and uh, um, Mr. Hyler was mentioning how the uh, satellite looking at soil moisture is collecting information shortly around the entire world, something that really I think we would have thought was science fiction only a few years ago. That information is also uh, complemented by locally collected information digital devices in the field to make household surveys and data collection far easier. We'll be hearing more about that today. In Cap Verde, for example, the census was carried out using tablet computers. Also, there's a whole internet of things. The mobile phone itself is tracking us everywhere we go. That data is seen by the telecoms companies, and they're already using that to produce a kind of virtual census on our mobility and therefore our income types and even to look at different types of behavior by analyzing the huge data sets they have, this big data. There's also this question of the Internet of Things. Devices are becoming smaller and smaller for measuring temperature, moisture, uh, acting as barometers. So, for example, there's already a key ring being developed that would provide all that information for the price of $20. So things are changing fast in terms of how we're collecting that data. And it's truly global, collected at an international and a local level. Structuring the data is difficult. And I think many of you will have heard of the whole idea of we had the internet, we had email, then we had the web. We had web pages linked together. The next phase was to link data together and make it in a form that was machine readable so that computers could make sense of that information and produce more applications for us. <coughs> this has grown again from 2008 to the current day where we have a myriad of data sets linked together, many of these relevant for agriculture. FAO has been particularly uh, active in this area, and we've taken advantage of their vocabulary, AgriVoc, and linked it together with another system of geocodes to make our own systems using open data. They don't look very special, but we've turned our document catalog into a completely different interface, being able to navigate now through the countries and regions and down to town level that our documents are written about through a map interface. So this was put together as part of this work through to the hack in, uh, on Saturday for Open Data Day. But this stuff is not rocket science. Many people can take advantage of it. And there are many applications across Africa, Caribbean, and the Pacific. Michael also mentioned that we had commissioned a study and worked together with Wageningen University, with Altera to look at what the impact already was for opening up data in actually in the field with smallholder agriculture. And we saw that there's not so much impact at present time. There were issues around governance where there's clearly been a change in transparency. And there are particular uses of this international data, both the meteorological and the space data and in addition to uh, a smaller expense, extent science data, such as uh, the FUSE data from USAID. But the potential in terms of looking through the applications which are already being tested and some of the elements that are already there, the researchers found there's a big impact if more of that private sector data can be opened at an aggregated level more si as more science data becomes available then there are many more opportunities to act on the ground. Agribusiness has already seen the value. If we look at some of the major players in the US, they've all recently been very active in purchasing software companies that provide 
support for precision agriculture through the use of data collected both locally on the farm and remotely through satellite. And in particular, John Deere, the equipment manufacturer, building more and more intelligence into their equipment, held their own big data conference last year. But what is happening in the ACP across Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific? Although I show Africa here, I say a little bit about the Caribbean and the Pacific first. We heard about this open data study. Many software producers working with that open data, and one of the uh, the hackathon that we held last year at the Caribbean Week of Agriculture, uh, one of the organizations there used open data within their application. Um, the Pacific looking at a, at a, a wide scale on how ICTs can be used, fundamentally utilizing the data across the region for agriculture. But here on the left, we have a map showing all the innovation hubs across Africa where small groups are getting together, being supported to incubate small companies and software developers to produce applications. On the right, we see how this is already producing quite significant, stable applications in agriculture. This drawn from the Mobile Producers um, Association, GSMA, and uh, many of these um, growing every day. We've also seen the emergence of a huge number of applications, specifically in agriculture, through CTA's work. What impact does this data change really have? Well, it really is changing even the way we do agricultural research. So big data, massive data sets are already being number crunched to look at differences in variety. This work uh, on uh, climate smart agriculture. Um, the World Economic Forum here talking about the power of big data in curating digital conversations and what we saw with the SDGs, the fact that general public could be invited, if they had access to the internet, to comment on the SDGs across the world and to take that data. So crowdsourcing our data. We've spoken, I think, already about some of the satellite uh, uses, but here's one where we actually can identify risks from the data that's available, and that means we can work with insurance to reduce the risks they are taking and make that available at a level where it could benefit even smallholder farmers. And finally, this whole question of turning your data open to others to visualize, to analyze, and make available through the use of open data. And IFPRI has been uh, particularly active in this with uh, indexes like the Global Hunger Index, where people have then produced other ways of visualizing and producing that data. So just to come to a conclusion, um, what does this mean at the smallholder farmer level? Okay, we can see that already in the States there are uh, big uh, companies getting involved. But this application, Smart Farm, is set up in South Africa recently with, together with IBM. And all of these are aimed at building efficiency on the farm. This claims to be able to reduce water use by 50%, the same kind of claim that PepsiCo is making of their own application that they give to growers. There are huge efficiencies to be made simply by knowing more about what's happening on the farm. The gadgets that are available are not so expensive as to put them out of the, root, uh, out of the reach of a community as a whole. And they would be able to tell you the health of a crop and indicate whether more fertilizer is needed or different, uh, different treatments are required. Um, the drones, here in the bottom, they're very rather small. There's someone launching a drone to do a kind of local remote sensing, so not relying on the satellite, which maybe doesn't have the resolution for a small farm. But we shouldn't think about this just as a highly expensive drone. There have been many different applications at the ICT for Ag conference uh, in Rwanda. We heard about people using uh, balloons filled with helium and uh, small digital cameras to do uh, e equivalent um, uh, images, uh, particularly in the infrared, where they could be used. So there are many ingenious ways of providing low-cost solutions based on this kind of idea of precision agriculture. Well, does 
the data revolution actually affect uh, policy? We'll certainly be hearing more about this from the next speaker, um, but I just wanted to mention a couple of things here in terms of we're changing the way that we process and acquire that data, recognizing the importance of communicating the data, not just the calculation and analysis. There needs to be access to that data in a manageable form. And uh, this, the top left was from the uh, recent RESACS conference where uh, the local strategic analysis knowledge support systems um, were presented. Uh, several have been launched in West Africa. Uh, Ghana, for example, now has an active unit. Um, this idea of communicating data top right, you can see the years ticking away, as are my seconds on my talk. And here, this whole idea of looking at visualization of analysis in a more convenient form so that people can play with the data themselves and make their own sense of it. And finally, the news story about what it actually meant to Nigeria when in recalculating their GDP, it was almost effectively doubled. So just my takeaway messages um, from the work we've done, and I have to thank uh, Islina Boto who uh, helped with the research for the reader and with inputs for this uh, uh, presentation. We really need to know more about the data quality. The technology, use and content, raising awareness of these issues we feel is important and what skills are required. There is a need to look at upscaling what's going on and identifying those things that are already working. Simplifying that data and analytics for the end users, there's a lot of effort going into that making the data more actionable to support decision making, and I know some of the speakers will touch on that, and the need for legal frameworks to guarantee data privacy and security. I think recent discussion at FAO online about farmers' rights to data is really crucial in this area. And finally, having the right incentives that public and private groups can work together on new business models to provide that data in a form that's more readily available and we can harness for agricultural development. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I will ask uh, uh, participants to keep your questions. Uh, later on, you'll be given an opportunity to ask questions or to comment. Now, I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Morton Javan from Simon Fraser University. Uh, Professor Morton has published widely in uh, uh, economic development and uh, statistics. His recent publication is on economic growth and the measurement considered in Botswana, Kenya, Tanzania, and Zambia. By the way, dear participants, let me tell you that. Uh, Word Bank last week uh, has published uh, a new document where Tanzania now is no longer among the 10 poorest countries. So that's good news, which I wanted to share with you. So, Professor, you are welcome, please. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, indeed, I will be getting on to uh, recalculations and uh, rebenching and uh, changes in rankings very soon. Uh, just preface my talk by saying that my focus here today will be about uh, states about policies, about knowledge, and about scholars. Not so much about how it impacts uh, how data flows to individual farmers and that particular decision-making process, just to make that clear. And also to make it also clear that uh, my uh, reference of study where I've done my field research is in the African region, so my apologies to my lack of coverage of the Caribbean and the Pacific. I'm going to be talking about first a what I call about a knowledge problem, the challenge of that knowledge problem, and then uh, at the, the very end we'll talk more about whether big data and whether there is such a data revolution that can match up to meeting that knowledge problem. I'll talk about uh, the state of the data for agricultural development, not the state of knowledge in big data, but the state of knowledge in 
classic traditional analog data, uh, the ones that is uh, co uh, collected by administrative uh, line ministries, the data that is collected through agricultural surveys and the data which is compiled following uh, uh, agricultural censuses. Um, I will talk a little bit about why I think that we have some particular knowledge problems, but how some knowledge problems, particularly scholarly problems, might look different than what are policy governance problems and how to invite us to think about whether big data can help national governance and international global governance. So, a uh, symptom of a knowledge problem. A symptom of a knowledge problem, as we know, on the 5th of November 2010, Ghana Statistical Services announced that it had new GDP numbers. It was revised uh, to 45 billion SEDI, and then uh, that compared to the yesterday's, uh, the days before numbers of 26 billion SEDI. It meant that the increase of the income level in Ghana uh, increased about 60%, and GDP per capita as measured by US dollars went about from $600 to about $1,100. The day before the revision, uh, Ghana was a poor country. Um, after the revision, it was a graduate and no longer eligible for concessional lending from the International Development Agency. This is good news, just like it's good news that Tanzania was announced to be 35 to 40 percent uh, uh, richer than we thought before a couple of months ago. Congratulations. But there is also a knowledge problem that emerges. Not particularly uh, uh, a particular knowledge problem for those who are interested in comparing living standards across time and across space. What do we do about these kind of jumps? And indeed, uh, the knowledge problems seem to be particularly acute at, for instance, the Center of Global Development at Central Think Tank in Washington, D.C., announced on blog pages, boy, we really don't know anything, and moved on to, to comment, responding to the Ghana GDP rebasing, that Ghana was the most closely watched economy in, in uh, in Africa, and how then, what do we know about other countries? Uh, UNDP in Ghana, meanwhile, said, uh, hang on a minute, uh, this must be a statistical illusion. Uh, our other data, social indicators and so forth, did not change overnight. We're sticking to our program. Shanta Dravajan, then chief economist at the World Bank, however, struck a quite dramatic tone and declared Africa's statistical tragedy. Uh, one might add that the tragedy was perhaps more on their side, and the tragedy was that they didn't know how little they knew. Uh, is Africa much richer than we think? As we just heard from Addison here, Nigeria did announce new GDP numbers, still preliminary, I might add, uh, announced on April 17 uh, last year by Yemi Kale in Abuja at the Sheraton Hotel. Uh, GDP almost doubled. Uh, in 2012, following the news of the Ghana uh, rebasing, I was asked by many, including the Standard Chartered Bank, how much was GDP underestimated in Nigeria at that time? Well, I could not do anything better but to venture a guess that there was about 40 times the size of Malawi's economy somehow unaccounted for inside of Nigeria at the time. I got that very wrong. It turns out there were 58. Uh, this is the subject of the book, uh, Poor Numbers, How We're Misled About uh, African Development Statistics and What to Do About It. So those who are interested in a diagnosis of macroeconomic statistics, look no further. But today I will talk more specific about knowledge and governance. So let's move ahead from no knowledge problems to governance. So my, my conclusion in this book on macroeconomic statistics is that our knowledge on statistics, official statistics, is doubly biased. We know less about poor economies. We know less about the poor people who live in those poor economies. And that's pretty central if you're sitting around this table thinking about ways in which we can devise policy to help precisely this group in that particular group of countries. Uh, where does that then leave evidence-based policy and development? Uh, if we know that the evidence is at that stake. Well, I would suggest to you, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that statistical priority also signals uh, policy priority. And that's why we need to look very cl closely at agricultural statistics. Lack of data may mean lack of policy. Uh, it's not, I'm not so certain about the 
policy that means that if we have better data, we certainly will have better policy. There are still many stumbling blocks, but certainly if there is no data, there is no policy. Yeah. So if, if there is no data on agricultural food production in a particular country, uh, go and check for yourself in the statistical office, then it's very likely that there is also a lacking uh, policy. So how does the knowledge problem look like uh, in agricultural statistics in African countries? Well, according to the Africa De Development Bank, which in response to poor numbers issued a report on GDP statistics, could report a few countries conduct re regular service or censuses of agriculture. The FAO Agricultural Bulletin Board uh, has, um, according, but this might be, they'll be able to update these statistics now, has reported that two countries in Africa have high standards, while standards in other countries, 21 countries, remain low. Uh, other scholarly work has said that very few studies permit any kind of comparison across time because the studies are so different and incomparable. Uh, it has also, other people said that past investment in statistical systems have yielded very little uh, uh, results in terms of uh, 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 permanent upgrading of statistical capacity and perhaps more damningly not really fed into national policy making. And it's also in a recent paper published, uh, will be published in a special issue which I'm editing together with Deborah Johnson at School of Oriental and African Studies, says that the existing lack of consensus on protocols and standards has resulted in agricultural statistics that suffer from uncertain quality, poor compar comparability and low credibility. That paper is one of those which were circulated for you uh, at lunchtime. So, let's that is the state of knowledge. Now let's think this through when it comes to relating knowledge and governance. Now let's pose a couple of types of knowledge questions which scholars will ask themselves. Do fertilizers work? Relevant question. Uh, are some parts of the agrarian economy growing fast? Relevant question again. And I think these are things we can give pretty straightforward answers to. We, we can check whether fertilizers work technically. We can observe this. Uh, we can see whether there is more or less cocoa leaving the port uh, and so forth. So we can see some things. Uh, but this does not always uh, pertain to the governance questions, which might be very different. So the governance question is not whether fertilizers work. It is, is our fertilizer subsidy program profitable and equitable? That is a, a much more challenging data question. Uh, or, for instance, it's not about whether some parts of the agrarian economy is growing fast. It is whether rural living standards are increasing, something that the uh, agricultural survey does not give an answer to. So, for instance, so see how, how, for instance, that could look like sticking with fertilizers, important question. Because I think, yes, there is a data revolution, but let's uh, not get ahead of ourselves. We, sh we cannot skip the green revolution ladies and gentlemen, and the, late, the, the Green Revolution is not lacking information necessarily, it's lacking capital, it's lacking inputs, it's lacking uh, other types of uh, water, for instance, fuels, uh, and not data. But let's look at one scholarly knowledge solution. So do fertilizers, do they work? Randomized control trials, borrowing from how they do studies in medical sciences, uh, Duflo and others, uh, famous from their book Poor Economics, uh, did a randomized control trial in, in, with smallholders in Kenya. Now this is what they do, control group, uh, placebo group and so forth. They gave some farmers no fertilizer. They gave some farmers too little fertilizer. They gave some farmers exactly the right amount of fertilizer. And they gave some farmers too much fertilizers. Lo and behold, it turns out that if you gave them the right amount of fertilizer, it is highly profitable. Now, this is, I'm, I'm of course uh, characterizing a little bit, but it, the point being that we have a very precise answer to the fact that fertilizers are in themselves profitable. That means they're worth the investment if done properly. But that's not what is keeping the Kenyan president awake of night. What, how to distribute fertilizer subsidies is what should be keeping up awake, uh, awake of night. So let's move to Malawi then, a political governance problem. Malawi had what was to thought to be a very successful fertilizer subsidy program. Jeffrey Sachs announced it to be so at the New York Times uh, and said that farm yields are now soaring in Malawi once nitrogen got back into the depleted soils. Now, if you look upon that very, very impressive crop data coming out of Malawi at the time, 
it, it showed that in the 2006-2007 Ministry of Agricultural Data coming out of Malawi showed 3.4 million metric tons of maize. The only problem about that number it, is that it could only be reconciled if three things were going on at the same time. If you calculate how much that was, uh, that how met metric tons like that, then either Malawians were getting fat because they were eating too much maize, or they were exporting a lot of maize, or prices were falling through the floor. Neither of the things were happening, and it turned out that if they did a census, which was delayed for a long while, that the real figure was 2.1 million. Yeah? Uh, and why was this happening? How can you inflate the number of, of 1.3 million metric tons, which, by the way, is a lot of truckloads of maize? Uh, well, it was through their per, per capita voucher system. It was turned out, if you compare the number of households registered at the Ministry of Agriculture compared with the census, we're talking about 1 million ho ghost farmers, 1 million households. And the yields as well, if you look at the National Statistical Office, said 1.6 kilo. Uh, FAO said 2.6, uh, and uh, the Ministry of Agriculture said 2. So let's look upon then what these traditional sources of knowledge are. We have administrative data, agricultural census, and agricultural surveys. As we just this demonstrated, administrative data might be unreliable because they feed directly into the political process, um, and there uh, might be lack of resources. They, agricultural extension services is not as uh, uh, developed as we would like it to be. Agricultural census, that would be very nice, but it's very expensive. Very few countries have been able to hold one. Very, very few has been able to keep with the FAO advice of having one every decade. Uh, agricultural surveys, well, that's good. That's good, in, maybe not good enough. It depends on recall. You have the farmer has to remember what he has produced. Uh, and designs, uh, and that sh you, if you, you compare it with what you find in diaries, you find that particularly for what is called fast crops, uh, bananas, fruits, and so forth, it does not match up with what you find in the production diary. And uh, as you say, the answers are not always relevant for p policy. There are other issues which I will not go into. Uh, one of the reasons why it's difficult to count crops is because you, it's just basic things. It's not about just getting more surveys. It's difficulty of, yeah, okay, so let's count bunches of bananas. Well, you know, they can come in many sizes. Let's count cassava. Well, they can also come in many sizes. Here's a 25 kilo sack of cassava, a bit packed to the rim. And probably here, uh, based on this picture, I dare estimate that cassava production might be underestimated. Uh, here's another, uh, Question, uh, comparison, what's the weight of different crops in what is a 50 kilo sack? A 50 kilo of maize does weigh 50 kilos of maize, uh, but uh, a 50 kilos of uh, beans is actually 80 kilos of beans, and so forth like that. It's just not that easy to count as we think it is sometimes. How then can we, s since we have not been able to settle this on planet Earth, can we settle it from the space? Can we get this a handle of this from, from gro measuring this from space through the satellites which were not sent up and, and others? You said it's not rocket, rocket science, but that's precisely what it is, isn't it? <laughs> uh, sorry. So, here's uh, on the World Bank uh, Evaluation Impact blog. Uh, instead of writing large grants, spending days traveling to remote field sites, hiring and training enumerators, what if you instead could sit at home in your pajamas and with a few clicks of a mouse download the data you needed to study the impacts of a particular program? That's the promise. You just don't have to go to Malawi. You just have to download the NASA data. Yeah. Quick wins, I will admit, so I just don't get accused of underplaying big data here. There are clearly reduced costs in recording. The, one of the costliest things of doing an agriculture survey is to step around the plot with a tape or a rope beh hanging behind you and then try to figure out how long that rope was and make sure it didn't get stuck somewhere and so forth like that. GPS helps you out. Uh, reporting through handheld devices, sure, brings down. If you look at uh, costing of a survey, it's travel, transport is the biggest item. So yeah, service will be getting cheaper. Data processing. The first ger German population censuses took 12 years to compute. We come a long way. Now we can do it in a couple of months. Yeah. Uh, but problem one: you need, in order to use this data from space, you need prior knowledge. It, in this particular blog, you said to measure the outcomes at the level of the individual farm plot, 
you need to already know that plot. You need to know what is grown there, and you need to have it measured. Yeah, uh, there are measurement errors, so that it works on in, in U.S. farms, but it says small plots, less than half an acre. They're too small to be measured currently. Okay, they can be better. Yeah, uh, even with plot boundaries in hand. So if you knew exactly what you're measuring, so if there has been a fantastic mapping of the whole sector and it's all well known, even then uh, you might be able to not be able to, of course, get data on profits, earnings and so forth. Satellites can see a lot of things, but not exactly how much money you exchange. Uh, they, that could be possible through mobile data, sure. But let's remember the, the, the unrepresentative sample. If you have a mobile, it's very likely that you have more than a dollar a day. And if you're interested in serving you because you have less. yeah. Um, so applying these approaches to low-income countries, in conclusion on the blog, is hard because you lack ground truth data. So if you're looking at the sat satellite data, you need to, to compare it with the benchmark. You need ground truth data. You don't know what you're measuring unless you, you absolutely uh, know it. So some big questions for big data. How do you overcome the ne need for a benchmark? Even the Billion Price Project at MIT it measures its own success by measuring how close did we get to the CPI, uh, which is official statistics. How do you overcome sample bias? The uncounted in official statistics are uncounted in big data as well. And how do you get policymakers to abandon their national statistic office and say, fine, Google will provide? Uh, so the way forward, I think we should ask ourselves some questions on priority. How high is A, statistics on the agenda, B, agriculture on the agenda, and then C, the combination of the two, agriculture statistics. Just how high is it? Uh, integration, we might want to think about how to integrate FAO, MAO data uh, with the bigger system of social statistics. I think the technological way forward is going to be a long uh, process of trial and error. Uh, we need some serious dose of realism. Not all that counts can be counted. There are other ways of knowing than through counting as well. And warning, evidence-based policy or the donor version of it, paying for results, often turns into exactly the opposite policy-based evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor, for your good presentation. Uh, and uh, I would like to invite another professor, uh, the driver or the owner of car number CD675, please go to your car because it seems you did not park very well. <laughs> thank you. Now, thank you, professor, for your presentation. It is now, uh, we are ready to hear from Another professor, Professor Massimo Torero, Torero uh, who has researched the, over 15 years. He has been researching in the applied research, and uh, he's going to give us the answer, the answer on the question posed to him. Can data revolution improve food security? And uh, Professor Torero is a professor on leave at the University de la Pacific, but today, is a professor in action. <laughs> You're welcome. OK, thank you so much for, for, for the invitation. Uh, and the answer to the question is not yet, and there is a lot to do. <laughs> but let me, let me go through uh, my presentation. What I will try to do, and it's very consistent to what you have heard before, is trying to bring up uh, some explicit examples of why we are facing certain problems in linking data available to what uh, farmers will need, for example, uh, and, and how they can use it. And, and basically what the evidence is showing in terms of the, of the studies that have been done up to now. And I will combine this with ICT technologies because many people talk about the progress in ICT technologies, the access to mobile phones, and therefore how that can be used to potentiate the access to, to data. But I think still there is a lot to, to move forward and there is a big gap still that we need to resolve. So some examples. If I am a farmer, I want to know what will be my price in the future, and I want to know how I can predict that so that I can decide what to plant today. Precision farming, of course, gives me such a level of information. But remember, to do precision farming, I need to have extremely good soil maps, uh, one in 25,000, like the US. 
And that's not found in most of ACP countries. Uh, it's not found in most of bigger Latin American countries, with the exception of Brazil and Argentina, which is now declining. That's the only way I can really get precision and know what soil I have, what conditions I need, and what varieties I can bring to produce. So that's something that we need as a precondition, and that data doesn't exist, sadly. So, and just to have an idea, to do a high-level resolution uh, soil map in a country like Honduras, okay, which is a medium-sized, small country, it will cost you $10 million. We waste a lot more money, many other things, when we can just use $10 million to develop a very high-level uh, precision map that will allow us to have this type of precision agriculture if we're able to transform. So in terms of the prices, this is what we can do and what we do, for example, at IFPRI, uh, from where I come, International Food Policy Research Institute, every day. We have a model behind where we estimate uh, the number of days which are excessive volatile. Okay, this means that I can tell in the world for basic commodities with a very fancy model behind, uh, with a lot of precision, if today I have an excessive volatile day or not. And I won't go in details on the model, you can look at it at our foodsecuritypol.org. But to be able to do that at a global level, basically we're using futures markets. Why? Because we need high frequency data. That means significant amount of observations to be able to estimate such a model, which is a very flexible, non-parametric model. If I want to do exactly the same for Africa, for Asia, or for Latin America, it's impossible. I don't have such level of high frequency data on prices that I can estimate with such a precision and define for the farmer today if they are going to face a significant volatility today. Even I can, I can forecast volatility with the global data, but I cannot do it uh, for these type of countries. And we're trying to do that. Now, of course, you can resolve the problem from now onwards, and many agencies are trying to do that, and they start to collect daily data, for example, of price commodities. But I lost the history, and I need time series. I need significant amount of points in time. So that's a big problem that we are facing today, which doesn't allow us to use state-of-the-art technology to be able to have better and good information for farmers to make decisions. Exactly the same happens with insurance, index insurance, for example. Despite of the problems of the index insurance, one of the major issues is how costly they are. And they are costly because the reinsurance companies don't have enough data to be able to have a good estimate of the loss function. And therefore, they have to basically reduce the risk by charging higher prices. Now, yes, you can use satellite data, and you can combine satellite data with the weather stations. And we have tried that. But when you start to look at the time series of the satellite data and combine it with the weather stations, there is a huge, huge uh, problem and measurement error. They are not compatible at all. Okay? Now, we can do a second best, and we have done that, basically develop some econometric techniques to be able to reduce the measurement error by combining both of them. But still, we are far from it. Again, history is a problem. In, La in Central America, for example, uh, there is history, there is data but it's not well processed. So two concepts, lack of history of data, but also the lack of capability to analyze the data properly so that you can get what you, what you want uh, and you can use it properly. A second example is how we can use some the existing data to measure and to present things so that can help policymakers to make decisions. And this is the global hunter index that IFPRI is trying to bring up uh, in the last years, and they have tried to follow this over time. The asset of the hunger index is a very simple index which uses secondary data being collected by other agencies. But basically, basically what it's trying to do is trying to measure homogeneously with the same very simple index over time what we call the, the hunger index. And that produces a map. But it's basically a combination of three variables, undernourishment, underweight, and mortality, which come from secondary sources. What is the major problem we face is that those inputs, those variables that we use are very outdated. And it's very difficult for us to come to policymakers with very current information. In some cases, we're able to improve that, for example, in the case of India. But again, although we can systematically measure with the same simple technology, and the simplicity here was to be, be able to avoid any weighting issue, for example, which normally is the discussion on all these indices, again, the problem is how we can get updated data uh, currently so that we can have uh, more better information for policy makers to, to make a proper decision. And the third example where I think we should bring uh, the private sector is the, the revolution of mobile banking and mobile money, for example. And M-Pesa is one of those nice examples. Now, again, if you look at the telecommunication sector, they handle an enormous amount of data. If I am an incumbent company in mobile phones or before in fixed phones, I handle all the traffic data by consumer, and I know some characteristics of the consumers because they have to buy, and when they buy, they put some information. 
That allows me to estimate elasticities. And that allows me to do a lot with that data. But that data is not public. And the typical case that we face, like in the case of mobile money, is that normally the mobile money is handled through telecommunication companies. And those are companies that behave in a market of competition. So they will have oligopoly, few players, or duopoly, or monopoly. And they will never share the data because of a huge value to them. And that's a very important data. And that's some things that the government can play a role. They can regulate in such a way that some types of data that they manage can be public. And that could give us enormous information, especially when we're looking at finance market and linking the finance market to the telecommunication market. Okay? So I can get information on both. I can get willingness to pay information. I can try to estimate some elasticities, things that could be very useful even to stimulate competition in the sector, but also to find ways to resolve problems through consumption plans. So the beauty of the cellular phones are the consumption plans, which basically what I am doing is I am developing plans based on elasticity information that adjust to each of the different types of consumers I have. That's why a small farmer can have a prepaid phone and he's paying more per minute than I am paying in my plan living in a city because he wants to consume a less amount of traffic than me. Okay, so they gain with me by quantity, they gain with, with him by unit because his consumption uh, uh, profile is different to, to mine. So that's information that we need to find ways to get access, which I think is pretty important. Now, what are the three elements which at least I believe are, are pretty important to look at? Especially if we are looking at this idea of telecommunications and taking advantage of those, complementing it with the data, and also trying to link and look at food security, especially look at farmers and, and small farmers. There are three elements for me which are important. First, connectivity. Second, content. And third, capability. On connectivity, we are living, I think, something which is not true. This idea that everybody has a, a cellular phone, is not true. Of course, there has been a significant improvement, and this is the evolution of cellular phones relative to the population. But uh, still, the gap is important, especially in the poorer areas. And if we are looking and thinking of uh, smallholders, that's a problem. This is also subscriptions uh, of cellular phones per inhabitants, and you can see how Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, have improved significantly. But when we look inside the countries, and we look at the penetration of the rural areas relative to the urban areas, we see significant gaps still, very important gaps. So the numbers that normally ITU, the International Telecommunication Unit, will publish on penetration are aggregates, okay? But they start to decompose inside, and this was a very complex job because we had to look at data within countries using latest household service. Then you see that there are countries that have significant gaps despite the urban area has significant penetration rate. So the argument that every farmer will have a cellular phone and I can do extension or send them prices, that's not real. Uh, still, there is a big problem there, and that's something that we need to look carefully. There are some countries that like, are, are improving significantly and are succeeding, like the case of Senegal. There are other countries which are not there yet. So we need to learn from those. But that inequality uh, still exists, and that's something that we need to look at carefully. Now, what is behind that inequality? Pricing schemes. And nobody talks about this. And sorry, but I couldn't include too many details here on, on ACP countries, but that's what I had. But just to give you an idea of the variance, look at the variance of a basket, a common basket, so I can compare across time, okay, of the minutes of, of prepaid telephone consumption through different countries. Look how it changes. And that explains significantly the lack of access. Okay? And if I bring ACP countries, I assume this will increase significantly the variance overall. Now, let me bring an example of Brazil, okay? Uh, and, and why it's important this example of Brazil? Because basically we know that 5% of my income is being used to, to consume telephones. That's more or less the, the rule. If I take that 5% of my income and I look at the income desires and the amount of money that I will imply and the tariff and the cost of that minimum basket, everything which is under the shaded red area won't have access to phones. And the desires are in the, in the horizontal axis, so the richest and the poorest go to the right. So again, you see a huge access gap because of the pricing schemes and because of the lack of regulation in this type of service. So again, let's not dream too much about this new access to cellular phones. There are a lot of issues that we need to keep resolving, and there are other technologies today that could be more efficient than cellular phones. For example, IP telephony is free. Data and voice don't compete. I don't need cellular phones too much. So let, let's think carefully how we can improve uh, and how we can take advantage and resolve this access problem. 
And the worst is the broadband, no? So look how far we are still in terms of broadband if we are thinking of a solution of IP telephony, for example, which is free in terms of voice. Uh, and again, this is how the, the movement is happening uh, of, the, of the usage. Uh, and again, clearly, Africa is dark, no? Uh, so, so we need to do a lot there. And a lot of the countries which have improved and deployed fiber optics in Africa are exporting. And they are not using it internally. Uh, so, so we need to car look carefully at that, how we can exponentiate fiber optics, which is cheap to deploy and could have a significant effect uh, because of the no competition, is no rivalry between voice and data transmission. In the content, I think is where, where I want to focus most of my, my comments, is another issue which is extremely uh, of concern in the sense that there is a lot of sources of information, as we have heard before. I can get information on prices. Reuters, for example, provides a system of prices for India, for many African countries. There are many companies providing services of prices. Now, sadly, most of those systems of prices are not useful for the farmer. Because if I want to look at the volatility, for example, I want to know the volatility of the commodity I'm producing. I don't care about the, the wheat price in the futures market in Chicago. Okay, I care about the excessive volatility in the local market or the three local markets which are my market. I don't care about in India, for example, of the market, uh, the potato, the wholesale potato market in Delhi. I care about of the market where I'm selling. And normally most of the provision of information we're giving to farmers is where the data is or where the data is easy to access. And it's not what they necessarily need. So we look at, in terms of the content, and all the different services that, that has been provided through, through different devices, extension, market information, policy, environment, and laws, natural resource, and geography. There are several systems. There are advisory services concentrated. There are systems that are moving across and, and giving, providing services to, to different groups through agribusinesses, and this could get very complicated, and so on and so forth. But we look at all the evidence, OK? Why? Because clearly, getting information to the farmers we know that it will, re it will be cost-saving, it will reduce transaction costs, it will improve efficiency, or it should improve efficiency, it should lower input costs, and it should market, uh, expand market search, because I will know where to sell, and so on and so forth. And there is a set of studies, and sorry for the little numbers, but this is a paper that is, uh, we have just published. You can get it from my, my webpage. Uh, basically, it's a literature review of all the papers that have been published until 2014 on using any ICT technology to transfer information to farmers and their impacts. Okay? I just wanted to see what happened and, and what, what was the result. And what we found is a lot of heterogeneity and lack of consensus. But what we try to do is try to make this systematic. So basically, in this graph that you can observe here, we split the commodities that they were looking at in each of the papers by low value, mixed crops, and high value commodities. What was the objective is that we expect that in high value commodities, I need to move them fast because they deteriorate very quickly. So the information should have a higher value. But in the horizontal axis, what you have is the penetration rate of the location where these, these papers were being developed. So basically, if I have low penetration, I will expect that the information have bigger value. If I have higher penetration, I will expect that the information will have a lower value because more people have access to technology, and they can access to information. And basically, what, what I want you to focus is when we were in very low penetration, these are the studies, the earlier studies, uh, in those, there was a significant result in terms of the effect of the access to cellular phones and information. But when the penetration started to grow, when we have more cellular phones, it was only significant in the case where it was high value commodities, and when the content of the information was good. This means when the information was really what the farmers needed. And those were the latest studies done in 2014 where we could look at the quality of the information. So again, the conclusion of this for me is that information matters, but the quality matters. And specifically when you have high penetration is where the value of the information for high value commodities will matter more. On extension, there are several studies, but honestly, the impacts have been very low. And we cannot observe real impacts today of extension services provided to the farmers in terms of using these technologies uh, and in extension mechanisms. These are some of the studies and some of the results, but basically the, the effects are pretty low and most of them are at the level of the outcome in some cases. So they follow some of the recommendations, but they didn't have any impact. Again, what it means is that the 
information they are transferring to the farmers could be reaching them, but it doesn't have an impact because the quality of the information is not appropriate. So they could follow what they are saying, but they are not getting the result they want. Okay, so something to, to look at it. And just to finalize on capability, it's a big problem because if we are going to use information and, and we don't have a mechanism to translate that information in ways people understand it, okay? For me, for example, if I want to look at weather, the farmer knows about weather. Uh, and they have experience on it. They have been growing and they know more or less. So I need to find ways to get the information from them also, in addition to what I can collect. But, but again, most of the information we provide to them, how I provide to them variability of temperatures, how I provide to them variability of prices. It's very complex, and especially in electronic devices, you don't have too much of, they, are, they don't have iPhones and iPads where you can put pictures. We should think of very basic telephone devices where they are getting the information. So one of the things that we are working on, which we believe could be a way to resolve this, is working with the children. And taking advantage of the children in the schools to be able to transfer information to them with the hope that they will transfer information to the parents. So I just want to finish with this hope, and we have tested already with some issues related to nutrition, but basically the idea is to use very simple technologies that can allow us to teach children in high schools, for example, with the hope that I will resolve the problem of capability and that they will push up information to the parents. This is what we call upward generational mobility. And if you have kids, you know the kids learn in the school not to smoke, and they will come and bother you the same with the greening. Seems to work, and we have tested, and it's working pretty well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof, for your good presentation. Now it is time to hear from official, <coughs> official yes. chief staff statisticians and the director from FAO, Food and Agricultural Agriculture Organization, to tell us on the about lessons learned on strengthening strengthening statistical capacity in ACP countries. Mr. Pietro, you're welcome, please, Chief Statistician. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair, and uh, um, thank you to CTA for inviting me to this uh, uh, interesting workshop. Um, I have to say that maybe uh, the expectations were not completely satisfied and met uh, during this, uh, uh, because my previous speakers uh, uh, presented a, a situation that is not so promising as uh, were in the introduction of this, uh, uh, of this uh, panel. And I have to say that uh, I share uh, most of the uh, thinking and of the um, uh, ideas that and comments that were presented by previous speakers. First of all, my uh, main takeaway message is the fact that uh, uh, big data is not the solution to all our current uh, data problems. Uh, we, big data and uh, new technologies can help but they need to be combined with uh, uh, survey, with traditional sources of information in order to make it more effective, more cost effective, to make it more sustainable. But uh, alone, technology is not the solution. Um, the other point is that uh, we are flooded with information, it's true, but not the right information. So also, uh, the message that was uh, uh, given by, by Maximo Torero before, that not any kind of, info of information is useful. It's, there is a lot of information that uh, is not useful at all, that we cannot use for our purposes. So um, the growth in information uh, sometimes is also even confusing uh, the, 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 the users. So let me uh, go back to the uh, the uh, my presentation. Um, I will skip this because I'm mindful of the time. Um, so, providing an overview of what is the situation in terms of statistical capacity in uh, ACP countries, especially uh, of the agricultural of agricultural statistics, and uh, uh, I think that this is essential in order to uh, develop any uh, uh, program of uh, improvement of data at, at country level. So, first of all, 
uh, a, a comment on what uh, uh, Professor Gervin uh, mentioned. Uh, it's not everything is not completely bleak in terms of statistical capacity. Uh, there have been a lot of progress, but these progress have been uh, mainly focused on social statistics. The MDGs, the MDG program has been a, the main driver of statistical capacity, international statistical capacity development in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And we, have, we are seeing the effects of this. But this has come to a cost of other uh, statistics, economic statistics, sectoral statistics have suffered from this uh, 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 focus, let's say, and especially agricultural statistics. Agricultural statistics is in a very poor status. Many um, evidence was provided by, by uh, Professor Gervin. Uh, I also uh, would like to say that uh, together with the African Development Bank, for example, we have done a complete um, assessment of all African countries, what is the situation. Uh, in African countries in terms of surveys, in terms of uh, statistical capacity, training, uh, institutional uh, setup, and so on. In terms of survey and so primary data collection, we have a situation that in the last 15 years, um, only less than half of the African countries, for example, have conducted either a census or an agricultural survey in the last 15 years. So. This means that, uh, and most of the countries have done actually an agricultural census, not an agricultural survey. And the agricultural census traditionally doesn't collect production data, collects area, not production data. So we don't have the necessary information on uh, production. The, uh, the other key point is that agricultural statistics is, uh, the methodology for agricultural statistics is quite old and uh, it's still uh, inefficient and not sustainable for many countries. Uh, agricultural data, when are collected, when we have survey, are collected in isolation. Uh, this is due also to the methodology that is used because the statistical unit and the type of survey are separated from the rest of the statistical system. But also there are problem, big problems in terms of coordination between Ministry of Agriculture and uh, uh, national statistical offices and across the rest of the statistical system. And we see that uh, uh, many countries, for example, have done a national statistical plan uh, in which st agricultural statistics is not uh, uh, present or very, uh, in a very minor way. Um, a key problem is also uh, the demand of data. And uh, this is due to the fact that uh, uh, agricultural data are, have little policy relevance. Uh, we, um, there is no linkage of agricultural production data with the socioeconomic dimension, uh, no link between farm and non-farm activities. Data are published with a big uh, uh, the time lag, and there is limited access to data. Um, as I said, limited funding for agricultural statistics, poor, poorer countries are the ones that have the uh, poorest data in general. But this is not the only uh, reason. For example, in small uh, highland, the, one of the problem is the size. And uh, in small island, st statistical offices, a statistical unit, cannot reach the critical uh, dimension that is needed to do uh, uh, operation in a cost-effective way. And so, in that uh, situation, for example, um, regional solution like uh, the uh, uh, South Pacific com com uh, community is a, 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 a the natural way of responding to these uh, limitations. And another big problem is the fact that uh, in many countries uh, we have had uh, uh, conflict, uh, wars, uh, we have fragile state, uh, we have even authoritarian regimes, uh, and uh, statistics thrives in a peaceful and democratic environment. Um, statistics office always are, most of the time, are also dependent from the Ministry of Planning. And uh, to build the trust in statistics and what statistics are produced, you need to have uh, objectivity, independence. So the situation of 
statistical capacity in uh, ACP countries, at least from the agricultural statistics point of view, is not, uh, um, is not rosy. Um, we have seen some um, positive experience uh, in the uh, recent years and also in using uh, technologies for supporting um, uh, basic data collection, basic surveys. Um, uh, experience, first, first of all, of integration of different data sources, so linking population census and agricultural census, uh, or having uh, surveys uh, household surveys, for example, that collect also agricultural production data. This is the experience that has been done uh, by the World Bank in some countries in, in, in Africa and by SPC again in the Pacific. Uh, another important uh, development is the linking statistics to policy making and the work that we are doing with CADEP on uh, revising the, their, uh, in helping them to revise their uh, results framework and uh, make sure that uh, the data that we can produce is uh, used uh, and can monitor, for example, the national food and investment plans, uh, designing open data policies, and all the examples of using new technology for agricultural statistics that have mentioned have been mentioned before. So, m using GPS for um, measuring. Um, areas, area harvested, or uh, uh, satellite images, remote sensing data for building the frame for doing uh, surveys. Uh, and here I have some examples of countries that have uh, uh, experimented that, uh, using um, uh, software to collect data with computer uh, or tablets. Um, and uh, mobile devices application to especially to collect uh, uh, prices, but also uh, animal pests and diseases uh, and food security information. Um, so going back to uh, the, my initial statement, uh, uh, big data is not the solution to all current data problems. Uh, first of all, the data that we collect uh, through big data are uh, uh, normally biased, uh, non-representative of the whole uh, population in a country. Uh, most of the time are only indirect measurement of social phenomenon. Uh, so we need a gold standard uh, as a benchmark to compare this data and to interpret this data. So alone they are not uh, very useful. Um, and then we need a stable relationship between the variable that we want to uh, measure and the, the, the big data estimate. And this relationship typically uh, change over time. So if they are meaningful at a certain uh, point, then maybe completely, uh, uh, provide completely different uh, and uh, unreliable uh, um, estimates in, in a few years' time. The ad another key point is that they are helping only to provide trend measurement, not levels. So if we need to have level information, level data, absolute levels, uh, these are not, it's not the solution. Uh, there are big problems in terms of uh, accessibility to this data, first of all, uh, because this is proprietary information in general, and uh, problems also of, uh, of uh, keeping the confidentiality of people that are um, using these uh, tools. Um, and then the other point, or the other risk, is the fact that uh, um, through big data, usually, you, tr you bypass national statistical institutions and you don't build capacity at country level. So the solution is to use the new technology, use big data, in combination with traditional data sources in supporting official statistics. So, as, as I said, remote sensing tool, satellite images can help to build better samples for agricultural surveys uh, or uh, from internet scrapping, typically big data, you can have information on concerns of local populations in terms of food security, water so shortages and so on. But needs to be complemented with uh, good, uh, reliable, and cost-effective survey tool. And um, I would like to make uh, two examples, uh, 
very shortly um, of survey tools that we are promoting uh, uh, now in order to uh, provide better information on one side uh, for food security and on the other side on, in terms of agricultural productivity of uh, smallholder. Uh, one key point, for example, is the fact that uh, you and uh, what uh, Professor Jervin talked about is productivity at national level. But there are big inequalities in countries, and uh, we know that especially in uh, African countries, uh, poverty eradication, hunger eradication uh, is channeled through agricultural uh, uh, growth in the productivity of the smallholders. And we know almost close to nothing to what uh, uh, is the situation of smallholder in terms of productivity, in terms of production, in terms of cost of production, in terms of farming practices, in terms of use of resources. So um, for this reason, we have developed these two survey tools that are also uh, very important for responding to the new um, sustainable development agenda and uh, to some of the targets that uh, uh, have been identified under uh, goal two of the sustainable development agenda that uh, uh, requires all countries to eradicate hunger, um, reduce food insecurity and uh, nutrition and, and nutritional problems and uh, um, uh, improve in a sustainable way agricultural production. Um, in that, in that respect, I tend to disagree with uh, what uh, um, Professor Jervin uh, mentioned um, on the fact that um, survey have problems, but these problems can be solved. The situation is not completely bleak. It's not that uh, um, it's true that, for example, um, we have a lot of consumption data uh, collected through surveys. Uh, with the different unit of measurement, and uh, then it's a problem to compare data across countries because you don't have the unit of measurement that is used by the local population, but it's just enough to introduce this uh, uh, information in the questionnaire of the survey, and then you can uh, uh, translate this information in comparable units. So, and we are working with the World Bank actually uh, in uh, improving uh, the measurement of food consumption and uh, also the measurement of agricultural production at farm level. So there are ways, but there is a not lot of experimentation that needs to be done to see what are the best uh, questionnaire, what are the best survey tool in order to uh, get uh, reliable and qualitative information out of it. And this is what we are trying to do, as I said, this is a project that uh, tries to overcome one of the key problems that uh, we are having at the moment. We don't have information on uh, food access, uh, disaggregated uh, for population group by at subnational level. The information we have that is produced by FAO, by the way, is at national level. And so this information is of little use to understand uh, inequalities at country level and to guide uh, national policies. So this is a problem. Uh, the other indicators that we have for measuring food security are indirect measures, either nutritional outcome indicators or uh, indicators that are based on food consumption. And these indicators have other problems. Uh, as I said, problems that are related to the fact that uh, uh, are only an indirect measurement of food insecurity, and uh, they are reflecting not only changes in the target variables, so food insecurity, but also other problems like health, water access, sanitation access, and so on. The survey that are uh, done to produce this indicator are done only sporadically, and are, we have an incompletely country coverage. Data are quite outdated, so usually we have them all with the three year, five years time lag. So they are of little guidance for uh, real-time policy monitoring and policy formulation. Um, and so we need a different type of instruments to make sure that uh, this information can be timely, uh, is directly measuring the um, uh, phenomenon that uh, we are trying to understand. So the experience of uh, people in uh, uh, accessing food and 
uh, that has a sound methodology that should be uh, uh, that uh, can produce comparable and qualitative data uh, across the globe. Um, we are collecting this information in 150 countries and we will be able to produce this information uh, uh, pretty soon. The same uh, uh, is true also for, as I mentioned before, for smallholder productivity. Uh, we know very little of what, uh, um, I mean, the little about smallholders, uh, as I mentioned before, and, um, and all the information we have is uh, mainly uh, um, relevant at national level. So we don't have um, information that can, under uh, can help us to understand inequalities in countries. So this uh, survey tool that has been developed will um, has the objective to fill this data gap and to provide a cost-effective and flexible way to collect uh, on a regular basis a minimum set of data that can be disaggregated by type of farms, by geographical areas and po population groups. Of course, technology is essential in order to reduce the cost of this data collection and technology will be used uh, for uh, measurement uh, area harvested through GPS uh, with the uh, uh, to measure, to collect this information with uh, um, open source CAPI software, so through tablets, and uh, um, to, for designing the sample with the remote sensing uh, information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director, for your good presentation. And uh, Director Pietro, for the last 23 years, he has been in uh, uh, official statistics. So do not ask him when a question on, on official statistics. It is time for questions. And uh, given the fact that uh, we, we received good presentations, I don't think whether there is anybody with any question. <laughs> but if there is, it is time now. Anybody would like to ask a, a question or to comment? Yes, you're welcome, please. Introduce yourself very briefly and uh, raise the question you'd like to raise. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je suis Jean-Cyril Dagalier, le coordonnateur du programme ACP de recherche sucrière, qui est financé par DEFCO aussi. Je, euh, je voulais remercier les, les, les panélistes là, de nous avoir euh, présenté toutes ces promesses alléchantes et aussi les déceptions qui peuvent venir derrière. Et, et je voudrais quand même... Euh, je n'étais pas trop d'accord avec les conclusions de M. Ferrero. Je voudrais vous rapporter les, les résultats d'un projet de recherche-développement euh, que nous avons au Swaziland, euh, qui concerne l'utilisation justement des téléphones portables pour la gestion de l'irrigation. Je pense qu'il n'est pas utile d'équiper tout le monde en téléphone portable. Euh, un nombre raisonnable de gens équipés, répartis dans des zones agricoles, est suffisant. Et je vous explique le projet. Euh, chaque agriculteur équipé de son téléphone portable lit tous les matins les mesures sur un pluviomètre, hein, les mesures de pluie qui sont tombées sur un pluviomètre, envoie par SMS le résultat euh, à la structure de calcul, hein, qui est à, à Simounier, et la structure de calcul, qui est équipée d'un gros micro-ordinateur avec un modèle météo, lui renvoie en retour la quantité d'eau pour son irrigation, la quantité d'eau qu'il doit appliquer dans ses champs en fonction de l'humidité, de l'atmosphère, du sol, de l'état des plantes. Et de ce fait, au lieu d'ouvrir le matin la vanne et puis de la refermer le soir, il n'ouvre que, que ce qu'il faut pour que la quantité d'eau nécessaire soit appliquée. Ils ont pu, de cette façon, autour de la personne qui était équipée avec son téléphone, les autres fermiers ont recopié la même information. Ça change en fonction des zones, évidemment. Mais ils ont pu diviser par deux le coût de l'électricité utilisée pour les pompes, pour pomper l'eau, à peu près dans la même quantité d'eau, euh, la même quantité, les, 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 les quantités d'eau utilisées pour l'irrigation. Et les rendements ont augmenté de plus de 10%. Donc, inutile d'équiper tout le monde en matériel très sophistiqué, euh, 
quelques-uns seulement dans les zones suffisent à diffuser les informations qui sont pertinentes. Et ça a même tellement bien marché qu'ils euh, se sont aperçus qu'en en envoyant par exemple l'âge de la plante ou la hauteur de la plante, on pouvait leur dire en retour si c'était utile ou non, ou si c'était la bonne période ou non, d'appliquer un herbicide. Donc pareil, plus besoin de mettre de l'herbicide à des stades où la plante n'y est pas sensible, on peut cibler parfaitement les stades où la plante, les plantes, les adventices, sont sensibles à cet herbicide. Et enfin, les, les sucreries se sont même aperçues que, euh, en, en demandant quel était l'état de maturité des cannes dans les différentes zones, ils pouvaient organiser la récolte et ils ont augmenté les quantités de sucre qu'ils recevaient à l'usine. Donc là encore, pas besoin d'équiper tout le monde, pas besoin d'avoir une télé... Une, 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 une technologie super sophistiquée, quelques personnes qui sont formées euh, au milieu d'un groupe qui vont les suivre suffisent à vraiment améliorer les choses. Ça veut dire que je crois qu'il faut considérer les, le, le big data comme un énorme buffet, avec de la nourriture partout, jusqu'au plafond. Et devant, le connaisseur ira chercher juste les mets dont il a besoin. Hein. Par contre, le gourmand essaiera de tout manger et développera des stratégies pour pouvoir tout manger. Donc je crois qu'au final, bah, ce n'est pas tellement la taille qui compte, euh, c'est la façon de s'en servir, très concrètement. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you so much for your brilliant comments and uh, enlightenment. Who else would like to ask? Uh, yes, introduce yourself and. Uh... Yes, thank you very much, uh, Michel Lavollet, Public Private Partnerships Europe. I'm do policy work on partnerships with private sector, but also support the work of private companies and programs in development. And uh, I, I'd like to pick up on, on, on what was said previously to define the challenge and opportunity more in practical terms and concrete terms in what we see as opportunities uh, growing in Africa. Uh, I work with a small innovating company providing weather data systems uh, for a variety of projects in Africa. And, and we do see that there's a challenge in the sense that there's a lack of basic infrastructure for data. But there's also a huge opportunity looking at ACP countries, Africa in particular, to actually do something that I haven't heard mentioned here is move to scale and move uh, on the basis of all these pilot projects that have emerged in every corner of Africa, uh, dealing with bits and pieces of agriculture research, water management, crop management, index insurance, climate adaptation, where we know we could, working with cell phone operators in, in the same model that was described, be very practical about it and provide usable data to those who need the data, basically. That's the challenge, and we know it's possible. We see it on a daily basis in all the projects that we work in in Africa that uh, it is possible. And so, in a way, I'm talking about something else. You're talking about statistics, you're talking about research, I'm talking about what is applicable in a very concrete and usable way, and making uh, climate smart agriculture a very concrete uh, uh, way of, of supporting uh, agriculture while respecting the environment. Thank you so much. Uh, well, who else? I think we are done. Y yes, please. Can come forward, please, and can use one of the microphones. Uh, my name is uh, Baudo in the Grave. I'm working with a number of people on a project, uh, a number of people of Africa and Europe mainly, on a project to collect uh, data locally uh, on village and neighborhood neighborhood level and to extract uh, data for socio-economic uh, planning locally with schools and so on. My question is, uh, in our experience, a problem 
uh, and mainly for FAO, I think, uh, is there a collection, an inventory of key data on agriculture, which is uh, because we discover we have dozens of sources with uh, World Bank, FAO, and so they have all kind of data, but it's it's a mix, and local people never can uh, find their way. And we are uh, constructing uh, standard uh, modulable files, uh, Excel and PowerPoint, to uh, in in a, a cube uh, database form, so that local people, local schools, regional schools can collect the data, which we have uh, experimented in Cape Verde, in, in Morocco, and Congo, and so on, and then uh, transform, put on the internet. Uh, we are making website on each village uh, uh, ready to to publish to uh, and to uh, uh, permanently in real uh, time update. So my question is, uh, we are looking for standard listings on all sectors, but uh, now on agriculture, which can be used as a standard uh, standard reference of key data, key information, uh, in, uh, let's say, all, all over the world, especially in Africa. Well, th thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, we are done now. And uh, I will give uh, uh, one minute to each panelist to respond to, to anything which uh, was raised here or to say a, a, few, a few words before we conclude this session. I start with the... Uh, with the director Pietro Gnau. Okay, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I agree that uh, um, in a way we were talking about two different things, um, producing statistics for um, uh, national and international um, uh, the international community and uh, uh, producing statistics for farmers at uh, micro level for improving their uh, uh, farming practices. In a way, we have to distinguish these two uh, different objectives. And uh, uh, data, again, data for these uh, two different type of objectives are different. And uh, we need to clarify that, and I, I agree with what uh, was uh, mentioned before. Um, the second point is uh, responding to the last uh, uh, question and say, yes, there is a reference uh, uh, database on uh, agriculture. Uh, and is uh, uh, Faustat, the database that is produced by FAO, has uh, a lot of problems in the sense that data, of course, uh, not are not all of, uh, uh, of uh, extremely good quality. Some, in some cases, we have data because we are publishing the data that we receive from countries. We are trying to validate data from countries. But of course, our primary source is the information that is produced at country level. So not always we uh, are able to produce the best information available. Uh, but uh, our work is exactly to uh, um, uh, support countries in improving the quality of their data. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, Massimo Torrero. Okay, thank you. So only two, two comments. Uh, regarding the cellular phones and, and efficiency, I completely agree. If you are very efficient and, and you can target properly people that can be diffusion centers to the others, that's perfect. But that's under the assumption that they will diffuse information. And that not necessarily happens across the board. So so we need to be careful with, with that. We, we have evidence showing that that not necessarily will happen. So it depends on how you select the people and how, and that, that's in very important in the process of the design. But if you need four phones instead of 400, that's great. Uh, that's the way to do it. Uh, and the other argument is you don't necessarily need cellular phones. You can use radio base or IP telephony, which will be cheaper, but in any case. But that's a way to do it. Uh, the, the, the other thing on, on the scaling up, uh, uh, I fully agree. But again, we need to be uh, uh, just careful. Uh, for example, uh, mobile money is something that is basically being replicated in many countries. Uh, in my own country, in Peru, for example, the superintendency of banking copy basically the regulation system that M-Pesa has in Kenya. Now, the problem is that when they did that, they are basically giving power of the, of the linkages to mobile money to the telecommunication sector, which is highly concentrated. So, and that could be a serious problem because you are basically linking 
a very concentrated sector to the financial sector, which is also concentrated. So it could create a, a, a problem in a country where mobile banking could work better than mobile money. So, so, so we need to be very careful on, on how we scale up uh, and, and how we can uh, adapt to the context where we are scaling up. But clearly, we need to identify best practices, be very careful that they are best practices, and then move forward as much as we can through PPPs uh, or type of institutional arrangements. Thank you so much, Professor Morton. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, you know, uh, yes, the, uh, this panel, including myself, uh, might have addressed uh, national statistical offices, uh, international organizations, and so forth like that. Uh, but uh, I'm not to, to argue with, uh, if a businessman is making a pragmatic decision, uh, he has my support to do so. Um, and, and um, you know, the, as it goes, the, the saying goes, you know, one ec I'm an economist, uh, one economist said to the other economist, look, there is a $100 bill on the street, and the, young, the older economist said, no, someone would have picked it up. But there might still be, a, a, might be still a, a $100 bills lying on the street, uh, and some of the, those might be related to data. And equally, I'm not here to contest uh, your, your study. Uh, if you say that efficiency increases 10% by, by using this data for, for some, uh, that might very well be. That 10% still has to be contextualized with other types of investments. And, and I mean, uh, we, we clearly have to value the value of information as an input on the site, like, uh, likewise, which we would uh, value the input of fertilizers, access to a road, and so forth. I think it's just important to remind ourselves that you know we can get very excited about mobile phones, but they don't reach everyone. And uh, you can get information about you know, imagine you're stuck in a valley uh, deep inside Tanzania and you know that the prices are very high, the valley over. You still can't text message your mice, mice crop over that, uh, that mountain and you have to drive around the mountain and so forth. So physical constraints still, still match and I think that's important to remember. Thank you so much, Prof. Chris? Oh, well, just a quick note on that last point, asking of the sources of data and information. Uh, just to say, with some of the materials we did, we did put together some key elements in the Brussels Briefing Reader on page 47. Uh, so that was uh, in the packs or available on the uh, top, and that's uh, this document here. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, I would like to thank uh, the panelists for your good presentations, and uh, I would like to thank you as well for your key remarks for those uh, the uh, Secretary General left because he was supposed to go to attend to another meeting. And I would like to thank all of you for participating effectively, for listening, for asking questions. And uh, now it is time for tea. You have 10 minutes. And uh, CTA has uh, prepared the uh, evening tea for you. Please make sure you participate. After 10 minutes, you are welcome back to continue with the, the next session. Thank you.
can make graphics, uh, perform comprehensive analysis at the country level or at the, 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 regional, the regional level. And uh, also the, the, the platform facilitates uh, the collection and uh, analysis and sharing uh, of data between the countries and, as I said, uh, among the countries and between the countries and the international uh, organization. Well, currently, uh, we have uh, a partnership with IMF and uh, through that data portal, uh, IMF can, uh, is no, uh, for, for some country, for 16 countries, are no longer requesting those countries to, to provide them the data. They get the data directly from, uh, from the portal. Uh, before the portal, this is the, the, how the data was transmitted between the countries and the international organization. Uh, from the country data, you have to have a format which is requested either by MF, FDB, or the World Bank. And each time a data is requested, the country has to follow the format in which the data is, uh, is requested. And you can see it's a repetitive and tiring, uh, tiring process for really for, for the country. But with the, high, uh, uh, the portal, we ha just have one unique uh, 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 data, one unique data mapping for all requests because the data is mapped into an uh, international uh, standard uh, and then all the, di the different users, the different international organizations can go directly really to download uh, the, 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 data, the data they need instead of having the countries going through the repetitive process and also in terms of having the country doing the reporting. So the, 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 the scheme is uh, uh, based on SDMAX so from the country's uh, classification or, or, or the data structure definition of international organization, so a, a mapping is done, and through that, uh, that, that mapping, we have a multilateral data repository where uh, all, all the international organization or any uh, public user can go and, and download, uh, download the data. Uh, you, there is a need of, uh, 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 for, for any, any partner really to register so that if the data is updated, she, he got a notice that uh, the data has been updated and he can go retrieve the kind of data he wants. Uh, the overall platform looks like that. Within a, within a countries, uh, you have, uh, for example, the central bank, the national statistical office, or the minister of finance. Each one has its open data uh, platform where it puts its, uh, its, its data. And from that, it forms the, the, the platform for the whole countries where uh, the data can be retrieved by the different, different uh, organization or use to, to elaborate uh, dashboard or use to, to do the the, uh, the de uh, any any analysis uh, the user the user wants. So what are the characteristics? Uh, as I said, it's a multilateral repository for 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 data, and instead of uh, uh, really reporting, uh, it's really pulling uh, a pulling or query model. You can go there and download uh, down, download the, the the data, and also the the, the platform is uh, now really play the role of uh, dissemination. It's no longer that the country reporting. It's just in terms of dissemination, the data is there and just you you, you pull it. And the access uh, is done, as I said, through the international standard uh, SDMX format. And uh, uh, also, uh, the data promote the use of uh, internationally recognized standard for better harmonization through those uh, data structures uh, de de definition. The advantage, uh, it, uh, you reduce the burden on the country in terms of uh, data, data reporting. Uh, it promotes the regional integration and harmonization uh, agenda. It improves the data quality through uh, the adherence to international standard. Uh, it also increases the access, uh, the transparency, and accountability. Uh, and also in the enhancing uh, regional member country of the bank to access you know, to, 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 capital, uh, to capital market. And also the platform uh, uh, can be used for monitoring and evaluation of uh, the development of the project. And this will help uh, to enhance the data, uh, uh, the bank uh, operation in terms of uh, the development in terms of, of, of project. So, uh, and also we have that uh, the bank is now a hub of knowledge center for the development of, of all the data for all uh, African, uh, African countries. So uh, the implementation, uh, the installation started in January 2013, uh, and uh, the, the data, the, the statistical data portal has been completed in 49 countries, 
and the open data platform in all African countries, including, including South, uh, South Sudan. What are the challenges? Uh, we all know the quality of uh, the internet f uh, infrastructure, which are weak in, uh, most, uh, in most African countries, uh, and also the level of knowledge uh, in terms of uh, IT uh, in most uh, statistical offices still is not at par. Uh, we have a problem of data management uh, by, uh, still facing by the countries. Uh, and also some government were uh, reluctant and some of them are still are to release uh, ti ti time timely data because of political uh, political issue and uh, also uh, the, the, the promoting the use of op open data some we still have some fear for some country wondering if uh, we have an open data are people not going to change their data what's going to happen how for which purpose those data will be will be will be used and uh, uh, of, to address all those issues, uh, we're conducting some capacity building, some advocacy uh, advocacy uh, workshop, really to, to, to have country adhere completely and fully to, to, to the idea of, of open data. And also one challenge is uh, we can have the data available if we don't have the resources or capacity really to analyze it and to make use of it. This, uh, the uh, there is no need. Uh, Really to have those, those there. So one of the challenges is to keep on continuing the capacity building, especially as I indicated earlier, in terms of data data analysis. So uh, the way forward uh, now, the, in terms uh, of uh, uh, moving, the bank is introducing at the government uh, government level uh, a data governance program. Uh, we pilot it with some countries, what we call e-governance. And also conduct some advocacy uh, action for government to release timely data, and also for the use of uh, data in decision in decision making, with a view to improve uh, management and uh, transparency in uh, in the countries uh, by promoting the use of uh, of uh, open uh, open data. Now there is a li some links here uh, which are showing how uh, those data can be used. Uh, uh, to, to do some analysis, to draw some dashboard. We have some, some, some uh, example. And uh, for given uh, the limit of time, we can, uh, interestingly, we can still discuss uh, about uh, those, uh, those, just to show an example from Nigeria, if it works. Okay. Okay, uh, this is, for example, uh, some uh, quick analysis on dashboard for, for Nigeria. You see, for example, in terms of food, uh, food security, the graph shows the depth of uh, food, uh, food uh, def deficit, uh, the graph, and then the map in terms of a different scale on, on the left. <coughs> okay, the global Honda index be computed on the base of, 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 uh, of data. Uh, the, the household uh, consumption, uh, the food expenditure per capita, and so forth. So all those data are available to directly uh, do do this, uh, some this, uh, this type of uh, of uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. So if, if you are interested, we can, as I say, given. Uh, the Short of the time, we can continue discussing on, on how, you know, so what, can, what type of data is available and also how can those data can be, can, can be used. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Abdullahi. It is very, very interesting development to, to, improve, to improve the data, data collection, data availability, data access. Once in the World Bank meeting, I said that data is to policy makers what genetic resources are to breeders. Now, if breeders do not have access to genetic ge resources, they cannot work. It's the same thing with policy makers. If you don't have data, they basically cannot make sound decisions. So, you know, this comparison between data for policy makers and genetic resources for breeders, 
and uh, people in the Berlin Bank have taken it up. I see it now everywhere. <laughs> so and the other thing is that, and I think Abdullah mentioned it, data is not the same thing as information. Data is the raw material. This, we get lots of data, data overload. But from the data, we abstract information. And we make decisions, and policy makers decisions on the basis of information. So information is, is made out of all the data you have. I mean, think about that. Uh, that's, that's very important. We have to move on with the program. And next, we have Theo de Jager, who is the president of the Pan-African Farmers Organization, better known as PAFU, and also the president of the Southern Africa Confederation of Agricultural Unions, SACO. And he will talk about how can farmers' organizations benefit from ICT applications of agriculture. Theo is well known to CTA. We have had, had him several times before. It's always very interesting, exciting hearing. So, Theo. Thank you, Chair. Some 15 years ago, South Africa exported most of its wool to Europe. But by 10 years ago, all of it went to Eastern, German, uh, Eastern European countries. By five years ago, 96% of our wool went to China. And two years ago, the Chinese did not pitch up at the auction floors, didn't buy anything, and the price of wool went through the floor. And you know farmers, they leaped onto the farmers' organizations and said, there's a crisis, we are going bankrupt. What are you going to do? Incidentally, I had a, a meeting with a CEO of a large clothing chain store one evening, and I, I asked him what he would have done if he was in my position. And he said, my friend, you have to do better marketing. You must convince people to wear wool. And I said, now, how will I do that? <laughs> what should I do? He said, appoint a teenager with a smartphone and a tablet and get the hell out of his way. Now, I'm the guy who, when we discuss ICTs, must go to the teenagers and get the hell out of the way. I know that we are on the brink, on the doorstep of a major turnaround in the management of data in agriculture. Wherever you go, big data is the buzzword. And yet, I also know my fingers are way too short and too big to get onto all these um, keyboards. <laughs> what will be in it for the farmers? You see, can you roll for me, please? This is an integral part of the dream which we have communicated amongst farmers' leaders over the last five years in Africa. Only in December, we had this wonderful opportunity to shake hands on this dream and say, let's get together again in 20 years from now and measure our success, our dream, to eradicate poverty to do in Africa what China has done over the last 20 years. To revolutionize agriculture by modernizing and mechanizing, by starting to unlock the potential, the agricultural potential of this continent. Because we say to each other, what we lack are value chains, linkages to markets, technology, expertise. Those are stuff money can buy. What we have is the stuff which money cannot buy. The land, the water, the heat and the light units, and the people. And to get there, we need the big data. We need the electronic platforms. And we need them to work for us. Turn, please. From our angle, how we see it, we, we need it as a management tool on the farm and in our organizations. We need the right information at the right time 
at the right place to empower me as a farmer or an agribusiness to make an informed decision. That informed decision must always lead to profitability, to better profitability. So, in it, we need the information on markets, first and foremost, on the markets. That's the pulling force in the, in the value chain. On the prices. Only last week we learned again that in, in Zimbabwe, our farmers get less than 10% of the global average for cotton and tobacco in some areas. Because they don't know of anything better. And there's only one buyer. The information on the financing, the mechanization, fuels and fertilizers, the seeds, chemicals, all the inputs, the infrastructure, technical ex extension, production, transport, weather, geospatial information, and all of those. But we need it to be integrated in a complete picture. Farmers do not take decisions in compartments. It gets confronted by the reality today, in this moment, in this place. And then this data, this information, calls for the so what. What does it say to me here and now? What should I do now to limit my risk and to maximize my profit? And then the action taken from there must automatically be fed back into the system again to be recycled and run back or upstream in the value chain. You see, just as money flows from the financier to the farm, downstream to the beneficiation, to the transport, the logistics, the supermarket, and the consumer's plate. So the information must run upstream to empower the financier again to limit his risk and do his planning. Can turn. The picture in the back of our minds as farmers is that if each one of those blocks would represent a farm or a farmer, can you go back please, and, and there could be these templates to assist on the planning, whether it is on my land, my production, my financials, my HR, my seed and fertilizer, whatever. And I have exclusive access to that template, to that information, because it's my management tool. The big data guys must be able to take a, a cut through it, a horizontal cut through it and collect the big data so that the input companies know what is being planned and those in the downstream value chain should know what the volumes could be. Control it on. Who should own this? Governments? <laughs> As farmers we say no, definitely not. Because then the information co which comes from it will serve a political purpose. Businesses, we will be very skeptical because they will use it to make more profit from us. Our own organizations, we simply do not have all the information to feed into it. It must be packaged in a public-private partnership. And we actually need somebody else to facilitate this deal. No, none of those three government, business, or farmers' organizations, can call this meeting together to close the deal. And it's urgent. I do not know of one of the national farmers' organizations on the African continent who has not yet been confronted by offers. Some of them, my home organization in South Africa, the offer was, we will give your organization free tablets or smartphones as part of the benefits which you can share with your members. By enrolling as a member in your organization, you're going to give him a smartphone. And he's going to feed a lot of information in it. And it's all for free. Which compelled us to ask, is free really the best offer you can make? <laughs> because we know there's big money in big data. Roll on. Can roll it on. Got stuck. And 
only farmers can propagate it. This is actually the handle we have on it in farmers' organizations. You need the, the involvement, the active participation of farmers to make this thing work. This is the axis we have. Farmers' organization is actually the field in which this information can be propagated. And for that, we need to strengthen the farmers' organizations. With my own selfish hat on as a leader of a farmers' organization, I see the opportunity here to finance the farmers' organizations in Africa, which has been a massive crisis to us up to, no to now. Farmers cannot afford their membership fees, so they'd rather not be an active member of this organization. But if the information which they feed into the system can subsidize their membership fees, we can strengthen the organization of farmers on the continent to the benefit of all the stakeholders, the governments included. And yet, for that, we need the capacity building within the farmers' organizations. And by capacity building, I always mean, first and foremost, governance training. You see, if we can replace the hando as the most common tool in the hands of an African farmer with the smartphone as the most common tool in the hands of an African farmer, then we are halfway towards our dream. Thank you. Thank you, um, Theo. I think the challenge is still to combine the, hand, the handheld hoe and the machete and whatever other tools with a smartphone. I mean, they are not substitutes. Another thought, you know, which are the biggest companies in the world today in terms of market capitalization? Think about it. Google and Facebook, what do they do? Handle big, big, big data. They're much larger in terms of market cap than any large manufacturing company in the world. And this is a reality today. Okay, move on. Now we have um, our next speaker, Herman Uitenbosch, who is the executive director of Fair Match Support, and it's all about value chain development, data for improved sustainable value chains. And value chain development is one of the three core competencies and areas of focus of CTA. So we will listen to Herman very much with, with interest. Herman. Well, thank you very much. And uh, CTA, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak over here. I was very pleased to be uh, put after uh, Theo, after hearing his speech. We already sat together. Uh, we have some background, but that's a long time ago. Uh, but also because it says a lot about uh, a little bit what we are doing. And I'm pleased that at least we try to do something with a couple of companies. And I, of course we will have a debate on that one um, in Africa. Uh, so I'm, I'm sitting here as uh, the founder and director of Fairmatch Support. We're involved in, uh, in an initiative uh, in the cashew industry uh, in Africa. Uh, based by some leading uh, companies over there and uh, under the umbrella of uh, the ACI and with funds ACI is the African Cashew Initiative, uh, G GIZ uh, led uh, big program in especially Western Africa and with support of IDH, the, uh, the uh, sustainable initiative uh, in the Netherlands. I will tell very limited things about ourselves, so late, but at least then you have positioned me as uh, our organization a bit. About us, uh, what we do is uh, we develop uh, future-proof sustainable supply chains. Uh, the world is changing fast and uh, we think that if you don't think of the answers of tomorrow, you're already too late. So you seriously have to think what is Africa, what would Africa should be in 20 years. I share a little bit your dream. Africa should look differently in 20 years as it is now. And it should be much more prosperous because it's a beautiful continent. Um, what we do is we support companies in finding, because we are well, relatively European-based uh, for a part, um, I'll come to that later, we support companies in finding new sources and uh, we, find, we support producers in finding new markets. The world is changing, uh, so that every now and then the question mark comes from a different uh, angle. We're very market-oriented, uh, we're independent, so we don't uh, operate for one company or for one structure or whatsoever. We also don't operate for one pharma groups. We're just working throughout the supply chain and, in fact, the supply chain and its actors are our clients, so to speak. We do it in a lot of uh, commodities, um, the whole range of nuts, especially, uh, except for 
pistachios. We do it in cocoa, we do it in uh, avocado, fruits and veg, uh, cashews as mentioned already, cocoa, fish oil even. <coughs> and our philosophy is a high quality standard for every uh, actor involved. Realistic and fair prof profit distribution. You can have a long debate of it, but if a supply chain is not beneficial uh, for Every actor in the supply chain is never going to work because one of the actors will not be in interested. That might be the producer, that might be a processor, that might be anyone. And we go for long-term collaboration. We would like to change trade relationship into business relationships. And it sounds as a word issue, but it's something completely different. If, uh, say, you and I sit down and we trade already for 20 years, but then we have a spot moment of uh, discussing our product. At the moment, we discuss that I would like to have a better product, then the farmer might say, well, I'm interested, but why should I invest uh, if I don't know whether you're going to buy? And then we have a different discussion, because then I will say, well, then we have to talk about buying in the future. So we would like to change those things. We operate, um, well, mostly in Africa. I think 80% of our work is in Africa and a little bit in Bolivia and uh, in Central Asia. So that's for uh, the issue. Now, what we are here for. Um, you see a cashew nut on the right top. Africa is one of the biggest, largest producers of raw cashew nuts worldwide. Nobody knows how much. Uh, so it's all estimations. We talk about data. Uh, but it should be something around 1 million metric tons uh, in Africa. Uh, only 10% of Africa uh, produces being processed uh, in Africa. It's all being shipped to Asia and uh, uh, processed over there, and only 10% is processed locally. There are definitely, and also we don't know the exact figures again, uh, millions of farmers, especially small-scale farmers, that are producing, selling it to middlemen, and then, well, either it comes uh, through the ports of Tema, Abidjan, San Pedro, and uh, end up in, uh, in Cochin, in India, or uh, it ends up with a couple of uh, processes locally. But it's, uh, that are small ones. Um, the world is changing fast. I mean, say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, well, let's be a, a little bit rude. Uh, there were only few people seriously interested in the continent. Uh, there was much more, um, uh, say, supply than demand. So why invest? The world is changing fast. Well, I like the story about the wool. I think it's, you can even mention it for a number of uh, issues. Uh, ten, uh, for a number of products. Uh, 10 years ago, I mean, most of the production of cocoa uh, would enter up in uh, the city of uh, the port of Rotterdam, of Amsterdam, and kind of the, in, it's almost sure that next year the biggest processing port of cocoa is Abidjan, is not Amsterdam anymore. So things are seriously changing, and not because it won't uh, end up in Rotterdam, but probably it will go to China, it will go to Asia. So there's a huge change in the market. It also made some changes in a lot of supply chains. Uh, a lot of buyers are seriously interested to start investing in, uh, in Africa as well. They have no clue how to do that, but they realize if we don't invest, if I'm a, a European roaster, if I don't invest in my resources, then I might run out of business, not tomorrow, not the day after tomorrow, but in five years I have a problem. So I think that's a major drive for a lot of companies to get seriously involved. But how to do that? How to, to deal with, um, say, a million uh, farmers that are not organized. I mean, and there are uh, farmers' organizations, I do agree with that, but in cash you'd have very limited ones. And if they are there, then they are not very professional, say, operating in a way that they can also sell and trade with a lot of actors. So how to do that? We thought a long while with a couple of leading companies how to, to work on that. And in the end, we found the solution a little bit at home. I mean, always can look around and see how farmers move because they learn a lot from each other. If you look at Dutch farmers, highly trained, they uh, collect all the data, they send it to uh, Friesland Campina, they are being benchmarked with their, co uh, with their colleagues, they get the data back, and in the winter time, Tuesday morning, 11 o'clock, they go to their neighbor, sit down and ana analyze the data. Why did they do it? It's pre-competitive and they can learn from each other. If I plow deeper and I can teach you how to do it, because we are analyzing the data, then I could improve my business. And it's pre-competitive because Campina or AVB, one of the big uh, uh, potato uh, buyers, is buying anyway. So there is no reason of not sharing and using those data. We thought, why not use that system? Why not start uh, selecting data, analyzing, uh, registering them, analyzing them, plowing them back to the farmers, 
And so farmers can also learn among themselves. That was a little bit the philosophy. Of course, farmers don't have a lot of uh, uh, ICT stuff. We already heard that uh, uh, around. So we had to be much more practical. <coughs> and that's what we did in the end. So in fact, what we did, we created a management information system uh, throughout the supply chain, because in fact, all the actors were interested for complete different motives in order to be involved in to know more about production systems and to invest in it and to look how we could work on productivity and, uh, and volume improvement at farmers' level. We, we created a kind of a system throughout the supply chain uh, in which uh, everybody is uh, putting in the data himself. And that system facilitates, uh, and it's a management information system, facilitating the supply chain as such. It's for all the actors, to all the actors, and I think that's one of the key issues. Each actor controls his own data. So for, a far, uh, for example, if you have a farmer co-op who has the data of all their farmers, they decide to their seller which data they're going to share with that processor, so to speak. Further up the supply chain, a roaster in Europe, say uh, Intersnack in Germany, they might know to know, also to want to know a little bit more about from whom they buy, how those processes are functioning. They can also, with the batches and with the shipments, uh, use or buy part of the data, even up to the retail. The kind of data might be completely different. For the supermarket, it's a nice storytelling to do some market about some producers in Africa, whatever. For a roaster, it might be much more on processes level because he has a lot of to deal with different roasters. And for, say, the farmers, uh, for the processor, it's much more, and I will get to that, about productivity because that's the final one. I have a small film. So you are in the cashew nut business. Yo, this you know, pros I think it's not, I can't put it on the, on the speaker, so I think it will become a little bit, uh, I can show you the website, the, the, the tube, YouTube uh, afterwards. I mentioned a little bit about trade. I mean, technology is very nice, but in the end, it's people who work with it. If you look at cashew, and cashew is just an example, it's the same in cocoa, it's the same in all kind of other commodities, it's a trade uh, uh, setting still. So major buyers like Olam, uh, people who are in the business, they, they know how they operate, they are traders. We realize that using that system and using all those data is only going to work if you change also the, the pattern of those buying companies that they are going to share those data as well. They have to restructure and rearrange their relationship with the farmers. So the project that we do is not only ICT based, it's also changing the relationship between uh, buyers and, uh, and we do that by sitting down before the season starts. Well, the, the season currently in West Africa is about to, uh, uh, to start. Before the season, we sit down with the buyers, with their agents. We, t we discuss about what volume they want. We register the farmers. After the season, we analyze who was doing what um, and who was uh, uh, delivering what. Later on, we share those data with the farmers. I will sh show you a couple of things afterwards. Based on what we observe in the sharing, we adjust our training. People always talk about farmers. There is no two farmers that are the same. Eh? I mean, that's, that's nonsense. If you have 100 farmers, uh, 10 are very commercial, uh, 40 are followers, and 50 are may maybe even dreaming of going to Accra, or going to Abidjan, and leave their farm or whatever. I mean, so and, and in the end, it's also not too bad, because at least if the first 50 can grow, and have a serious income on the, on the, on the farm, so to speak. Um, so that's what we, we do. We adjust the trading to the different groups, um, and we adjust our system as well afterwards. So we have a system next to the buying and, and in, in, in involved in the buying in training the farmers. If you have all those data, because data says they don't say anything, but the dashboard, it can be very, very useful in your analysis, say at processes level or at co-op level, who is doing what? Who is giving the best quality? In which farmers should we invest? Or where are the problems? Where are the, wh who are the serious farmers? I mean, sometimes people get training on pruning. Well, if they don't even uh, clean their land, why train them on pruning? I mean, that, that's, that's a different step in, 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 in uh, support, so to speak. So make it more adjustable to, but if you make those analysis, you can use that. Um, you can benchmark, so you know in which areas there's the farmers are more interested. But also if you plow those back, you get very nice discussions at farmer level. 
because they always think, and I'm now playing a little bit the bias uh, role, I can also sit in the in this chair of the farmer at a, at a different moment, and they always think that the other man, uh, man is treated better. But by showing the data, you can already say, well, he got a better price because he had a better outturn. His humidity was better. And uh, so, and, and then the discussion starts among those farmers. So how did you do it? So then I go back to the story where I started, how farmers are using it. By doing all those things, you create much more competition. Uh, not competition in a sense that you are competing with each other, but competition to become a better farmer. And you can lower your, uh, your, your cost in, uh, in, your, in your trainings. You can rank, you can rate, so you can use a lot of data with those things. Uh, and in the end, we have piloted uh, the last three years in both uh, about 30,000 farmers in uh, both Ivory Coast as well as in Burkina Faso. It seriously resulted in a higher capture rates, uh, higher qualities. I mean, people who are in cashew, I mean, there's a, there's a quality range between 43 and 52 or something like that. And the majority of the farmers went two points higher, which was a seriously significant income increase for the farmers as well, just by stimulating and working on the quality and by stop buying bulk because that was the, the previous setting to a lot of those settings. And of course also the training cost. There was a lot of discussions, how can you do this? Uh, do you need uh, iPads? Do you need iPhones? Do you need all those kind of things? We use what is appropriate. In a lot of settings, which is very remote, we just go with all our notebooks and we just write them down and when you have the notebooks, people will fill it in. In other places we do use notebooks. So I think you can just adapt it at the moment that is feasible at the local circumstances. And in the end, the analysis, well, that you have to do a little bit more sophisticated but because with 30,000 farmers in Excel sheets, you get, you get seriously uh, uh, frustrated, and especially under a couple of years. As mentioned, this has been an, an, an initiative by a couple of actors, both public as well as private. I see GIZ and the ACI and IDH as a kind of uh, uh, public uh, setting in that one. But it was seriously business-driven in the sector in order to use the data to, to improve both the relationship with the farmers. I'm seriously convinced with all those traders would like to change their attitude towards the farmers. And it's not because they like their farmers. I'm not going to be emotional on that. No, because they, they realize they need them. They realize they have to get better connected to those farmers because otherwise they also have too much competition. And I think the farmers should use that as a way that, well, they start investing in them. I think you should use them. That's what the initiative is about. We are currently rolling it out in, uh, throughout the supply chain. Uh, already as we speak currently, we operate in uh, Ivory Coast, Ghana, uh, Kenya, Mozambique, Benin, and uh, we set it up in, 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 in Africa, but it will move to uh, Asia as well in the coming period. I would like to keep it to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Herman. Very interesting case study of the cashew, Anacard, Anacardier in, in French. Very interesting case study, specific commodity, but I know in Cote d'Ivoire they say what, 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 that cocoa is in the south of Cote d'Ivoire, cashew is in the north of Cote d'Ivoire. Okay, so very important uh, development, yeah. We now have um, Ulrich Adam, who is the European Secretary General of the European Agricultural Manufacturers Association. And we talk about precision agriculture in Africa, the challenges and opportunities ahead. Of course, we all know precision agriculture has already been mentioned a couple of times. Precision agriculture is agriculture with lots of data. Without data, there's no precision agriculture. So he is going to explain that and you know tell us a little bit about precision agriculture in Africa. So, Ulrich. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting uh, Seema to speak on this, this occasion. Um, uh, the, the title of my presentation is the diplomatic version. When I was preparing a bit for it, I think the, the, the more radical title would be, and I've seen that on, on, on an article actually, bringing precision agriculture to smallholder farmers, are we dreaming? Um, uh, and, and that was mentioned before, um, the dream, so to say, um, as a vision, but also, I think, um, a bit of a step back to consider how, how far are we actually off and, and what concept of precision agriculture could work in Africa. So I, I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, five things quickly about who we are as SEMA because we haven't spoken in this forum before. A bit on precision agriculture, just, just to define it from the machinery perspective, the challenge, the opportunity, 
Um, and, and just a couple of remarks as the way forward, and, and that's also in line with the previous speakers, public-private partnerships. How can we make some progress on this? So, um, first point, just, just about ask quickly to say, SEMA is the, the European Trade Association representing the ag machinery industry. Um, so that's quite a bunch of manufacturers. You see a, a high number, 4,500, but of course in the tractor business it's quite consolidated. We have six international manufacturers. Um, and then in the implement area, it's more diverse and, and a lot of mid-sized and family-owned companies. High type of machine difference. I mean, you all know that farming is, 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 is always um, linked to the soil, to the local farm conditions. You need the adapted equipment to get the best outcome in farming. And, and a pretty sizable sector in Europe with 26 billion of revenue. Um, trade association structure, same as everyone's. We have our national members and, and, and cover, sort of, say, the European scale. But maybe just to, to, to look on this more, um, Europe, just in terms of the size of the industry, is still the world's largest producer of ag equipment um, with about a good third of the global production. And the second point is actually more interesting. Um, it's a highly innovative sector, and, and that's linked to today's topic. I think we've seen, of course, big advances in, in, in mechanization throughout the last decades, but I think now in the last 10, 15 years, we really see this new data revolution and the integration of the machine. And from our perspective, precision farming is all about bringing, bringing all the data and the information and integrate it into the machine to make the machine smart and, and make the machine apply inputs and, and operate in ways, increasingly also in automated and robotic ways, to do things in the best possible way um, according to local uh, needs. So, so that brings me to the second point, precision farming and really going back. What, what's the story that we see um, in precision agriculture in Europe and the, in, in the US? I think it's, and, and to a lesser degree, this of course also applies to agriculture in the, across the world, but, but the big pressures that we're under, we, we have of course the need for higher productivity, the production challenge in the run-up to 2050 with the glow, grown uh, world population. We increasingly have also societal and political demands to, to grow sustainability, to improve environmental performance in farming. And it was mentioned before as well, uh, very important for the, for the farmer. It must be economically viable. And, and there's a profit. Farming is, needs to be a profitable activity for the farmer in order to keep going and in order to invest in new technology and, and use new technology. And I think this is where, where in, this, in these three, um, not always, um, in sometimes conflicting overall challenges, I think this is where we see the, the smart equipment, the precision machine, is really a central or can be a central solution provider to all of these challenges. And uh, just to go back, I think precision farming into, into our sense is really about adopting new technologies, satellite navigation, positioning systems, sensors, IT applications, combine it with the engineering capacity on the machine and then build smart agricultural machines that actually are now, you know, the, the advanced machines are data-rich sensing, monitoring and management systems increasingly. So um, it's, it's, it's creating and opening up the data stream, uh, stream while, the, while the machine is working. And we had it, heard it before, the four R's really, doing the right thing at the right place at the right time in the right way. That, that's what in the end, the end objective to which also machines contribute. And, and the beauty of precision farming is just, just conceptually as well, to, to take a step back, is to see that it's on the one end comprehensive. We really have a wide array of applications already on the market in all sorts of usage that can be used in, throughout the entire crop growing cycle. So, you know, you use it you know, to make the, the seeding more precise, you do it to fertilizing more precise, the, the spraying, the, the harvesting, the overall yield forecasting. I mean, it really comes across the entire cycle. It's very tailored. It really helps to achieve ultimate precision on the field. And it's, a, so to say, a smart system in the sense that in the best of cases, it's constantly evolving in two ways because we still have a lot of untapped potential in terms of technology and uptake. And we still have, you know, the idea or the ambition is that the smart systems or, you know, you can refine and improve the algorithms with the new data you continuously feed into the system. So you can make, if you refine yield and soil maps and refine um, the, the usefulness of the, you know, turning data as was said before into useful information and applicable information. Um, so yeah, here you see sort of say that that's the virtuous cycle in the best of cases, precision farming really reducing 
um, unproductive time helping farmers to farm the correct amount of land, using the correct settings, full capacity, getting more hectares harvested per hour, and efficiently m m farm the whole system. I mean, that's, so to say, the ideal. And the ideal and, um, is, 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 so to say, happening. It's happening around the world, and, and we see the uptake. And in the best of cases, what you get then, linked to the three big challenges but I've mentioned before, is that you, you get a higher yield potential, you get less crop damage and crop loss, you get greater sustainability because you use less quantity of inputs. It was mentioned before, quite impressive percentage savings, whether it's the use of water, fuel, water, or fertilizer. Of course, it, it's site dependent, you know, it's different, difficult to say it's 40 or 50 percent or 30 percent. It depends a lot on how many of these elements you integrate in your farm and, and, and what farm you have, what size, what crops you grow. But across the board, we see quite big, big savings potential. It's higher use and efficiency and more environmental protection and then for the farmer it's of course um, a lot of benefits it's lower production costs in the best case but it's also reduced working hours and greater application speeds so also some 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 practical elements to to make the job easier um, for the farmer um, so so that's that's all a great story and 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 I think I could could end it here <laughs> But I think that's where, where, where the initial remark on the dream comes in, and, and you need to stop and say, um, actually, uh, Houston, we have a problem here, because um, if you really look at the challenge, I'm um, just put this quote on and, and read it out, and, and, and that, I think, is very much the problem. Uh, and, and David Cleary here says, so far the promise of precision agriculture is restricted to those with the capital and expertise to develop access and use the new technologies they're not cheap and they're not simple, at least as they have evolved so far. Precision Ag has a rosy future in the United States, and I added Europe, where yields are already relatively high and farmers are already relatively affluent. Uh, from a global perspective, this is a lost opportunity because Precision Ag is needed most where farmers are relatively poor, yields are relatively low, population increases relatively high, and resilience to climate change is most pressing. And, and that's where we come, I think, to, to Africa and see um, where, w how we can think, you know, what, how we can bring this technology promise and this farming practice that we see um, in parts of the U.S. and the EU um, to African countries. And, and, and here's another from Challenge to Opportunity. Here's another quote. It's a bit of an older quote, and, and I think it's good to see that things do have changed. Um, and, and this is a quote saying that... Um, Precision agriculture claiming still is largely irrelevant in developing countries. The need for spatial information is actually greater, principally because stronger imperative for change and lack of conventional support. So, I mean, this is more pointing already at the opportunity that, and it was mentioned in the previous interventions, that we need to find ways to, smarter ways and, and, and technologically feasible and ca less capital intensive ways to, to use some of the data um, revolution techniques to integrate them in, in agricultural and agronomic practice. So um, what I would say from, from our perspective, which is of course, you know, limited, I mean, I'm not claiming here to have a fully comprehensive approach. This is of course a machinery specific perspective. But the opportunity, I think, is we need to stop as well. We need to look back and say we need to do several things at the same time, and I've simplified them to two things. I think we need at least a two-tiered strategy um, because from our side, precision farming will only work as well, or in the best case we've seen, the best outcomes you get if it, if it ultimately has a link also to the tools and to the machine. So we need... Um, a, a sort of say of reinforced effort on, on mechanization, on sustainable inclusive mechanization, paired with the development and extension of Precision Act technologies that are appropriate for Africa. So let me tell, tell you a couple of words and thoughts from, from our side. Um, I need to hurry up. Um, so this is just remembering that, you know, tractors really in Africa moved from first mover to latecomer. The first tractor was, was shipped to Africa in 1904, long before the first Coke bottle in 1923, and long before mobile phones. But of course, um, if you look at uptake rates nowadays, Coca-Cola um, can be found in, in remote rural areas as well as mobile phone coverage. It was mentioned a couple of times, is, is quite abundant. So, I mean, there's obvious reasons why this is, because maintaining, you know, it's capital intensive, of course, much more capital intensive um, heavy equipment. It's also a question of repair and maintenance infrastructure. You need to maintain the equipment, especially after the failures of bulk mechanization in the 70s and 80s. 
and you need to have training and skills to make sure they're, they're properly applied so you don't get issues such as soil compaction and other, other negative effects. So, you know, it's, it's a more delicate, it's a more comprehensive effort and, uh, and of course, a lot more um, bigger infrastructural um, um, consequences involved. So, but still, you know, if you, if you then look again where we are for Africa, um, you know, it's it's really you see you see really a different world. You see the so to say you see the the EU and 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 US and Japan really with high rates of mechanization. Then then a second tier in Brazil, Russia, and then we really go to a very low mechanized levels in Africa, China, uh, Brazil, Pakistan. Um, so 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 there is a chance. And if you compare that actually with mobile phone coverage here and cell phone coverage in 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 Africa and, and India, you know that that's the rates. You know again that's the initial discrepancy. So we need to see, we need to keep these realities in mind and try to work with with what's there, but to find smart ways of how can, we can advance things. Um, on, on the mechanization efforts, we, we as SEMA and as industry are doing quite a lot. Um, I don't go through the theory. I can tell you here, here you see some practical examples of what our member companies are doing. And that's different things, whether you, you build model farms, whether you donate tractors or you give grants for farmers to, to, to buy equipment and operate equipment or you have training centers across Africa. It's just a snapshot of, of, of what, so to say, the industry is doing in terms of efforts. Um, we also want greater institutional support, I think, from, from, from institutions such as FAO or the EU, and we're discussing that with FAO to see that we can bring mechanization and mechanization strategies back on the agenda. Um, but since we need to come to a close, let me jump straight to, 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 to the second point, and that's really how can we then, if we, if, we, if, we, uh, if we are successful in promoting mechanization, what additional digital technologies can we, can we put, put to, 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 to make them work even better? And I think here it was mentioned before, it's remote sensing, it's, it's IT and communications technology, mobile phone, video sharing, recommendations on application of machinery and key inputs and if you look at the chain that's really i think the top top right corner that's that's the where we are interested we're interested in the step immediately before the application with with the machine and we see quite some exciting stuff happening there it was some of the examples were mentioned before but we have for instance you know video sharing on youtube a company for instance digital green is a company that that's doing a lot of educational videos in India and Africa on how, on how to farm, on how to adopt certain practices and teach um, um, uh, farmers via this online tool. You have mobile soil analysis pi um, pilot projects and then mobile phone. If you read The Guardian last week, this is the example of U Uganda where you had a very nice example that mobile phones save bananas from bacterial wilt in Uganda and that was essentially an in initiative where, where mobile phone sharing helped farmers to to be alerted about pests and 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 adopt their farming and and also their um their their, their, their crop protection measures thanks to this sharing. So um, final 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 remark from our side is one thing we also believe in. Let me just fast forward. Is 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 um, public private partnerships. This is just an example um, from the German Food Partnership, and that's an initiative in Africa potato initiative where, where we help with or where companies are helping with, with mechanization and and machinery training to, to, to get um, production up and running. And I think that should be also, and that's something I think precision act technologies are not really part of this yet, but I think that's something where also we need to see in these public-private partnerships where can we also integrate digital elements into such projects. And, and that's all from my side. I can just point you to, to our website if you, you're interested in, and we had some printed copies on, on, so to say, our position on advancing mechanization in Africa. And then the second point, we also have a big web portal on precision farming if you're interested to look, so to say, more on the, on the precision farming um, latest. Thank you. Yeah, Ulrich, I mean, mechanization is so important because, you know, mechanization can improve labor productivity, and labor productivity is the key to higher incomes. Labor productivity in Africa is generally still very low. And one key is not, not genetics, not agronomy, but also mechanization. And many now realize that mechanization is so important in terms of increasing labor productivity. The amount produced per worker. Okay. We move to uh, Stefan Boyer, Boyera, who is the founder and CEO of SBC4D. He will talk about how governments can use open data for the benefit of ACP countries. So, Stefan. 
Yes. Um, good evening. So um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm going to talk about uh, open government data, and uh, that's uh, in line with uh, what Mr. Abdullahi uh, presented before, uh, the importance of open data at the, the government level and how it can support um, agriculture. Um, let me take one minute to uh, introduce our company. So we are a consulting and software company specialized in ICT for development. And uh, more uh, in particular, we have uh, two domains of expertise. One is open data and open link data where we support uh, usually governments in uh, their national initiative uh, from assessments to uh, building software data portals to uh, training and, and so on. Uh, we also support and develop portals uh, for uh, international organization like the, the land portal for, uh, for uh, ILC uh, last year. So that's, that's one area. The second area is related to mobile and, and web services. Here again, our uh, activities span from strategy. So uh, we have been designing uh, ICT for agriculture strategy for uh, a couple of government in uh, Pacific Island and in, uh, in Africa. But that's also go till uh, software development, service uh, deployment, design uh, development and, and deployment, with a particular expertise on services targeting uh, illiterate uh, groups and uh, illiterate uh, communities. In terms of sector expertise, I would say that 70% uh, of uh, our portfolio is in, uh, in agriculture. Um, obviously, we work also a lot uh, in e-government services, and we have a, a couple of projects in, in health and, uh, and, and media. In terms of, of geography, about 70% of our projects are in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, the other are uh, in Pacific Island, particularly in, in Fiji since a couple of years, uh, in South Asia, in the India, Indonesia, and uh, in a couple of countries in, in Latin America. That's it for the marketing. I swear it will be the last time you hear about that. <laughs> Um, let me uh, now introduce uh, open government data. So uh, open government data, or uh, OGD, is a concept that was born in uh, 2009, and that uh, was developed first by uh, USA and uh, UK government, so President Obama and um, uh, Prime Minister Gordon Brown in, in, in the UK. And the concept uh, is that uh, the countries are releasing uh, all the, the, the public data they have uh, to, uh, to, the, to the public. And uh, these data of, have two specificities. One, they are machine-readable, what we say machine-readable, which is you can, you know, uh, through a software, you can use this data and, you know, analyze this, build uh, application on top of them, etc. So they are uh, exportable from a uh, computer. The second, uh, the second uh, key uh, aspect is that those data have a license, uh, have a, what we call an open license attached uh, to them so that uh, you can do whatever you want with this data. You can develop a uh, commercial service, you can match this data with other sources, uh, etc. So you are, you are free to, to use this data for uh, both commercial and uh, research uh, purpose. So why uh, such a concept was, was developed? Mostly, first, because there are lots of information available at the, at the country level, lots of, of data sets. And second, it's because it's a huge uh, opportunity for uh, many actors. It's a huge opportunity for the private sector and, and businesses to develop uh, innovative services uh, on top of this data. It's a, it's a huge opportunity for civil society organizations to, for instance, monitor the, 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 the transparency of the government and, and detect uh, you know, corruptions and, and things like that. It's also a huge opportunity for academics to uh, identify and uh, generate uh, new knowledge. So globally, thanks to that, uh, OGD uh, has been developed to improve transparency and accountability of, of countries, to improve public uh, service uh, delivery, uh, and that uh, in return leads to social and economic development and uh, also uh, the development of uh, the ICT sector and innovation in, uh, in the sector. So this is, this is let's say, the, the, the global view of uh, what is uh, OGD. So now where, where we, we, we stand in, in the world? This map is you know, uh, similar to lots of other maps we have, uh, we have seen today. That shows that, unfortunately, if you look at uh, ICP countries, uh, they, they are mostly blank spot. 
This map is from the end of uh, 2013. So since then, a, a couple of countries in, in Africa have, have joined the, the, the movement. But, but still, there is, uh, there is a, a, a lot of, um, lots of uh, you know, blank, uh, blank spot. However, I am, I am more than, than convinced that uh, the question is not whether uh, low and middle income countries will join uh, the, the trend, but more when will, uh, will that uh, happen. And I think that's one of the, the, the key messages I have on these talks, is that we have to prepare uh, everything so that the transition will be, uh, will be uh, easier. So how, how do you, uh, what do you need to, uh, to, to start a, a national uh, open data initiative that will lead to uh, social and uh, economic uh, development? From, our, from a, I would say, a, a, a general approach, you need these, these, four, um, these four dimensions. First, you need uh, the political level. You need to have the top leaders that are committed to engage in such an initiative. This is not a technology project. This is not a project that has to be managed at the uh, Ministry of ICT. This is a way to change the, the, the way the, the, the countries are governed. So it is essential that uh, the top leaders, the president, the prime minister, are uh, understand the, the value and are committed to, uh, to the process. The second part, and it was, it was mentioned a, a couple of times uh, today, there is the legal framework. In order to have an open data initiative, you need two things for, from the law perspective. First, you need uh, to give rights to your citizens to access those data. So that's, that's what we call the, the Right to Information Act or the Freedom of Information uh, Act. That's a, a body of, of laws that give the rights uh, to citizens to access uh, all this data. That's one part of the equation. The second part, obviously, you also need to have privacy law. You don't want to have your medical records uh, available uh, and, and so on. So you need to have the second body to protect the, um, the, the, the citizens. Those are the, 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 the two requirements uh, on the, the legal framework. Then the third level is uh, the organi organi organizational level, sorry, uh, where uh, because such a, again such an initiative is cross-cutting the government, so you have to uh, have in place structure at the government level so that all the agencies, all the ministries are able to work on this uh, transversal uh, initiative. And finally, uh, and, and that's not the, 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 the least important part, you have the technical level. You have to have a way to publish your data, to anonymize them, and then make them available uh, to, the, to the public uh, on a portal, on the model of uh, what Mr. Abdullah uh, showed um, show earlier. So those, are, those, those four um, um, was it pieces are quite uh, generic. That's the way you will engage any country in, uh, in OGD. However, you know, the way uh, UK and US have moved to open government data has nothing to do with the, 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 the way that low and middle income com country uh, will move to open data because the challenge are completely, uh, are completely different. Uh, there are differences mostly on, on, on three, uh, three points and you know, I have no time to develop them but, but those are, are important. First, the legal framework I, I mentioned earlier. There are very few countries that have appropriate laws, either at the privacy level or at the FOI, Freedom of Information Act uh, level. But that's, that's relatively easy to, uh, to, uh, to solve. Um, the second point, which is data collection, I think we have heard uh, the whole day that's, that's the issue, how you collect data, how you store data, how you move from paper to uh, electronic data. That's, uh, you know, that's one of the, 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 the major uh, issue. And then the, the last point, and probably that's one also one of the, the most important, is that the concept of uh, open government data has been that you know, uh, citizens will benefit from it if they access innovative application on the web and you know accessing the web accessing ICT in general uh, in low and middle income, income country is uh, a challenge so people does not have computer people does not have uh, smartphones they have very basic phones they have radio so you have to adapt the way that uh, open data can benefit the, the the citizens and I think that's that's uh, a, a critical point uh, in order to not have a, a very nice uh, initiative that has absolutely no impact on uh, social or uh, economic uh, development. 
let me uh, stop five uh, five seconds on, on on the technical uh, level challenge. Um, as I say, usually technology uh, is easy, but um, but I think here what's important. Uh, to say is that uh, it's it's time right now to prepare the the, the, the technical level. There have been uh, investment in ICT uh, since more than a decade. So each and every international organization are bringing their own ICT systems to uh, all the countries in which they are providing uh, technical assistance. However, there is a completely uh, separation between, you know, the provision of ICT services and these trends uh, related to uh, to uh, open data. So if you really realize that uh, this is a trend that will develop, it is essential that any investments you do in new ICT systems uh, are uh, I would say uh, open data ready that have the functionalities that s could uh, make them, you know, uh, ready when the government decide to, to publish the data uh, online. And, and I think that's um, that's essential. And that that's a message both for the for the country, but also for the the, the international organisation that are providing these uh, technical assistance. Uh, they have to, you know, uh, take into account this movement, and they have to be sure that their open data department talk to their ICT uh, department that are providing the usually the very proprietary system that are uh, completely uh, closed. So perhaps I can just um, take an example about uh, one of the, the system we, we developed and we are still working on in, uh, in Fiji, which is uh, a market uh, information system. So uh, last year we, we, we worked with the, the, the Ministry of Agriculture to, to uh, design a, um, an ICT for agriculture strategy that's included upgrading their, um, their market information system. Before, they were using an old, uh, old which was like eight years old uh, FIO system. There was, uh, you know, an access database uh, that was uh, fed by uh, papers. You know, the collectors uh, were going on the, the markets, feeding papers. These papers were centralized uh, in Suva, and uh, from then, an operator was entering them, meaning that, and then they were published on the, on the newspaper. So usually it took from, you know, five to six weeks uh, before, uh, at best, before you can get uh, information. In the new, um, in the the, the, the new uh, approach, uh, they wanted to to uh, move to a more dynamic system. So we develop uh, we develop for them uh, a collection system based uh, on uh, applications. I have to be quick. Based on applications uh, on tablets, and um, and now all the data are uh, centrally connected, uh, available at the time of the the collections. We know that they were collected at the market. Uh, Etc. But the, the Fiji government is not yet engaged in, a, in a, an open data initiative. But within the software, because we are aware of, of, of these trends, then there is just a flag to put on so that tomorrow this data can uh, be available. That's what I mean by preparing the, the, the technical level, and that's, uh, that's uh, essential. Very quickly, to, to, to also uh, uh, make a couple of points, a couple of, of challenges that I have been uh, finding in absolutely all projects uh, I, have, I have worked on. Would it be with NGOs, with uh, you know, mobile operators, or, or with, uh, with country? You know, we talk a lot about data, and many uh, speakers have mentioned the need to uh, provide the right information at the right time. That's, this is critical, but how do you do that? And the only way you can, you know, move from this huge uh, data set to actionable information at the small order farmer, the only way to do that is to know who are your farmer, where are they, what are what are they producing? What are their fields, etc.? So usually, that's the first thing I, I tell people: build a database of your beneficiaries. And and they are telling me, well, this is not sexy. You know, this is not tablet. This is not smartphone. Yes, this is not sexy. But that's probably the most important thing on which you can build your 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 strategy. Second, second, and and, and last point. You know, ICT is not going to be the the magic wand that solves all your your issue. It's just a, a tool. And I have seen also, particularly mobile operator trying to buy bypass all the existing networks, human networks, would it be cooperatives, would it be extension service? And this has uh, no 
uh, no success because you know the building trust is essential, and it's far more efficient to empower existing human network and, and use ICT as a tool compared to trying to, to bypass all these uh, these um, uh, these uh, structures that are already existing. Quickly uh, to finish, so um, I think the, the, the key point I want to, to, to make is that I'm convinced that uh, open government data is a trend that will develop. So it is essential for all the organizations uh, to, to, to prepare uh, their, their platform to, uh, to, uh, to do that. Um, we have to be careful that you know opening data is just the first step. What's important is you know how you provide the, the benefits of opening data to to people, to citizens, and uh, you know there are little attention on building those ecosystems, and I think that's that's um, that's uh, essential too. If you want, uh, I think you have in the in the documents a list of uh, relevant uh, resources. If you are if you are interested. Uh, Particularly, one uh, we we did a study last year that is called uh, Open Data in Developing Countries: State of the Art that that give a, a broad overview of all the activities that has been happening uh, in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. That was quite interesting. The Open Data Initiative. Our last speaker will only speak for about three to five minutes, uh, I was told, is Magdalena Anna Kropiknika. She will talk about open data and improved land governance, the case of the land portal info. So, Magdalena. Thank you very much. Um, just to begin, uh, I'm here to present Land Portal. The goal of this presentation is uh, not only that you, at the end of this week, hopefully uh, take a look at Land Portal, that info, um, but also that you look at it and, and perhaps find ways in which uh, your organizations uh, can uh, can find ways of partnering uh, with the land portal. Um, I myself represent uh, Food and Climate Consulting, which is I'm an independent consultant with my own uh, organization. And I, I'm here to uh, represent Land Portal uh, as one of its founding members and as uh, a partner uh, organization that is one of its users. Um, just so I will just very quickly go through the possibilities of, of how the land portal has evolved. Um, it hasn't in fact evolved, um, I mean it hasn't evolved overnight. It has been a project that started initially in 2006 um, by a few organizations coming together and realizing that uh, there is a need of making land tenure information more accessible, information about land more accessible and that's extremely scattered and not easily available. Um, so it took years before actually a uh, land portal has evolved to what it is today. Before, in fact, it was called landtenure.info, but landtenure.info doesn't exist anymore. It is landportal.info. Um, and it is, in fact, the open data revolution that has allowed for a land portal to have become what it is today. I will not go through all of the details of, of its uh, of its evolution, um, but I will go right into, um, okay. So basically, uh, the land portal operates uh, with the few principles. First and foremost, uh, it's technically open. You can search for it and find it easily online. It's available in an editable electronic format or an, or an API. Uh, so it's also legally open. This is probably the foremost important aspect of open data usage and of the land portal uh, use of, of, of the accessibility of data. You can use it freely. What's really important, you can also reuse it. You can redistribute it and you can use it for commercial and non-commercial purposes. It may require that you attribute the publisher when the data is used. All of the above should be clear in a usage license or terms of use. Any, anybody can take your data, repackage and recombine it and sell it. Most of all, Land Portal also provides with tools uh, in how you can actually repackage the data yourself, which I will show you in a minute. So it is based on the idea of open knowledge, transparency and open development. And here's Land Portal. So uh, if you go visit the first page, it will look like that. It is currently made out of land book. The land book is where we store information which you can search either per country or per region uh, from diverse sources from which are recognized institutions. 
We have a page on land debate where people can use uh, share information on land related events uh, as well as blogs. Uh, there are also online discussions that are being monitored and uh, um, that are being um, facilitated by the land portal. And this year there will be Land Library, which will be uh, launched, and it will be a repository of land-related information, including peer-reviewed publications, policies, maps, and multimedia content. So here is what, for example, some of the land uh, per, per country land book pages look, and it's extremely user-friendly. Uh, I, I really encourage you to use this. Um, we are using the um, we are using information on countries uh, based by FAO uh, on the same way as FAO does it. We basically have information from databases from FAO, IFPRI, the Land Matrix, OECD, UNDP, and the World Bank. Um, one mention here very quickly about the land, land matrix. Uh, the land portal uses information about different facets of land, also about food security, about land administration. Uh, Land Matrix uh, is a project of uh, International Land Coalition and partners, which is focused on land transactions itself. Uh, so we also feed in information from it, but we are a separate entity. And, and, and we have a much more generic look at uh, land-related issues. So this is the reusage of data that I'm so excited about that I wanted to talk about. So you can download uh, country and indicator pages you will find. And there is a link that offers a uh, possibility for you to download that and, for example, export that into Excel sheets. You can also grab a widget, which is really useful if you're making uh, presentations. You can compare countries. You can also choose the kind of graph depending on what kind of uh, statistical data you will decide to look at. Um, obviously, knowing what you're comparing here and knowing what data you're looking at is definitely helpful because if you'll be, for example, looking at a statistic between on the number of transactions in land from the land matrix uh, between Uganda and Uzbekistan, you will find that there's zero in Uzbekistan, but you would have to know that simply land matrix does not cover Uzbekistan. Um, that is just one of the ways that you, some knowledge about uh, where the data comes from is also very useful. Um, linked open data store, you can also use that and find information about, in fact, where that data is coming from and the statistical information. I'm going very fast because I know everybody's really tired. Um, so I'm moving on to the second part, which is the debate. Uh, land, uh, offers land portal offers the possibility to also communicate with other land practitioners. And I will go on to the end, but just showing you who are the users. We currently, the land portal has over 70 partner organizations. So these are the networks that are being covered. And currently, the focus for the next year is localization strategy, which means finding ways to collaborate more, especially with the research and data centers in the global south. And thank you very much for that, and uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you, Magdalena. We could probably have on the CTA website a, a button that, uh, that, that links to Land Portal, uh, Michael. Probably we could have some link there. Okay, so thank you, Magdalena. We have 10 minutes for questions. I will allow three questions, 10 minutes maximum, because it's about, we are 6, 6 p.m., and I thank the interpreters to stay with us for another 10 minutes. Um, Stefan? Yes, I have a question for Stefan. <laughs> I am Francois. Francois, one, sorry, sorry, and sorry. One, and one for Theo. I Francois want to go, Stepman, yeah. I want to go back to basics. Which big data do we have today in Africa which is untapped and on which we could tap easily? And if you reflect on that question, then you will see that it is private property, mobile phone companies. Now, I had a meeting with Zain in Nairobi three years ago, and it was incredible how forward-looking they were 
into strategizing how they could tap on their data coming from farmers. Which farmer is buying which fertilizer in which province in Kenya, for example? This is a gold mine because if they know this, if they have the data, and we talk about big data, thousands of farmers, when they know this, they can start pushing SMS messages to farmers where they are buying or selling fertilizer company products. So they are looking really forward. And I did not have the impression that the panels of the first one and the second one have tackled that issue. The first panel said, yes, the mobile phone companies in Africa do have a lot of data, do have a lot of big data, but I'm afraid, and it's a question for Stefan, do you see any indication that mobile phone companies living in a very competitive environment in Africa are willing to share their data with governments, etc. And for Theo, my question is also very precise. I think you are sitting on a gold mine because as farm organizations, you have the profiles of thousands of farmers. And I see the East African Farmer Forum, Stephen Muchiri, said that this is a type of information which mobile phone companies are very jealous about. Now, my question is, do you have a strategy to make money of that gold mine? Thank you, Francois. You, you know, as a farm organization. Yeah. Uh, our friend Theo, he is sitting on a gold mine anyway. I mean, he's in South Africa. <laughs> anyway, two more questions. And then I give the floor to Stefan and Theo. Two more questions. Everybody seems to be tired. We have had a long afternoon, six speakers in this session. No more questions. I wait two more minutes. <laughs> Think hard. <laughs> the thing I was lacking this afternoon a bit is how we go from data, massive data, to information. Information is what you use to make decision making. Data is a raw material. Information <laughs> is what you, con what, you, what you condense out of it. Yeah, okay. Question? Pardon, oui, juste une question euh, sur les coûts de tout. Yes, just a question relating to the cost of all of this. The quantity of data which uh, arrives is huge. You need a data center to stock all of this. And this equipment uh, is costly. So do the African countries have the ability to bear such a cost? Yeah, thank you very much. One more, uh, Isolina. I'm allowed to ask a question. Uh, Stefan, I want, well, and the others, one of the things which seems, uh, in addition to the cost that Mr. Dagalier uh, raised now, is the capacity. I mean, uh, it's um, the high skilled, you know, uh, capacity which apparently, according to statistics, is already scarce in uh, advanced countries like in the US and Europe. So, is it uh, something that, you know, can be addressed? Easily, in a sense, or uh, it's really a challenge. Thank you. CTAs are the capacity building business, so it's important for CTAs program to to lessons for capacity building. I give the floor now to first to Stefan. Okay. okay. Thank you. So uh, lots of questions to answer. Is it okay? Yeah. yeah um, so to answer to Francois first. So. Um, uh, th th there are multiple things in, in, in what you are saying. So um, operators are playing multiple roles today. So uh, lots of them are trying to develop services to farmers directly. So, but I, I will put that aside. So just as an operator, they have lots of information about uh, people themselves. There is also they have lots of information that you know it's 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 pretty new, but people may be aware of uh, new development. So that's if you measure between two uh, tower uh, the 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 strengths of the signal, you can detect the rainfall by just the, the modification of uh, the, uh, the 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 radio signal between uh, between two stations. So they have access to lots of of informations, and uh, as always, they are uh, probably operators. That have uh, that are more open-minded. That understand that they are not able themselves to 
to exploit this data for the benefit of all. So typically, in my experience, headquarters of big operators, and, and I'm working, for instance, for, for a lot for, um, for Orange, uh, they understand that, and they are moving to, to that. So uh, if you take the case of Orange, they have organized in the last two years uh, two challenges, one in uh, Ivory Coast and one in, in Dakar, that is called uh, uh, Data for Development. And it's exactly what they do, they release data and, and organize competition about what people could do with the data they, they release. So there are some of these operators that, that understand the, the value, they understand that they, they are not best placed to exploit them and they are uh, in, the, in the process of uh, opening them. In my experience also, it's clear that they're uh, usually they, they are, they are, um, their um, subsidiaries uh, are, are, are less uh, business focused and, and less in, in this process. But, but I see light at the end of the tunnel. Now to, to, to go back to your to your um, capacity building. Yeah, ca capacity building. I think that there are different and, and also the, the, the cost of, of uh yes. Mister. There, 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 there are multiple things to to, to, to consider. Uh, at the capacity level, there are uh, capacity related to statistics and the quality of data and there have been ample discussions about uh, the poor quality. I think open Opening data is the best way to increase this quality because then you have others that can check this data and tell you this is wrong, you know, and you know, and that's a way. And we have seen that in many organizations like uh, the Global Funds, which is in in health, they have been releasing data, and in return, by the feedback they are receiving, they are improving the quality of their of their collection. So I think it's it's an opportunity. Perhaps the data is poor, but. But that's the message I always uh, tell countries. It's not because your data is poor that you should not open it. It's the opposite. You know, you open it so that it will uh, it will improve. Now about the cost, I, I, I am more uncomfortable. Uh, the, the problem I see is that it's 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 not only cost; it's also infrastructure. The fact that you know most of these approach are uh, centralized. You have big center everywhere. everywhere. Based on the based on the the, the the hypothesis that you know everybody is connected with fiber optics to to uh, to everywhere, so you can put everything in the cloud, and you, do, you don't have to care whether it's in the U.S. or in the U.K. or in, in South Africa. This is probably true when we are in Brussels, but you know if you are in rural Mali, that's that's not the case. So um, I think there is a need to uh, what I call downscaling the web. Uh, so that you know, you move more for the decentralized uh, approach. In in the same way, lots of countries are focalizing on their international bandwidth without exploiting what they have internally. You know, have not having uh, appropriate exchange point at the local uh, level, not uh, doing caching and that kind of things. So I think there is a lot to do in in infrastructure. Now I am a bit less concerned about the cost of data center. I mean, if you see the price of gigabyte, it has fallen perhaps even more quickly than the, the, the growth of, of, of data. So I, I don't think this is, uh, this is a, 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 major, uh, a, a major issue, just the, 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 hardware, uh, the hardware part. Then, of course, you know, being aware of, of security, of management of all these data centers, there is a lot of needs in terms of uh, capacity building in that area too, because, uh, again, what I have seen is that lots of organizations are providing technical assistance, but it is in silo. Instead of having this approach of data center where we share infrastructure, what you see is that you have lots of intervention that is developing their own small things, making things even more complex to manage and all these things. So there is, there is another message to push, which is you know trying to to have this approach of centralized uh, information system that could be shared at the at the government and, and country level. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Theo, about exploiting your gold mine. Thank you, Chi. We, we know about the gold. We do not yet know how to dig it out. <laughs> and even worse, we... You use a we, pan, you know? We simply do not have that pan yet. Remember, we are farmers. This is new to us. I'm concerned that a number of farmers' organizations have already signed contracts with entrepreneurs and that they, they get very little out of it. I'm concerned about the compatibility of the various platforms. One, one would love to have, a few years from now, 
something which is compatible with each other all over the continent. Um, I'm concerned about the way farmers' organizations have sold cell numbers, cell phone, mobile phone numbers, um, b because even the cell phone company do not know which of their clients are our members or our farmers. They can only see that uh, the cell phone is used in the deep rural areas all the time. We have discussed the possibility of centers of excellence. We sit with 54 countries on the continent. Each one of them must on their own do the scientific testing of new varieties of seed or chemicals to approve it in those individual countries. Although the borders between our countries are really um, as if they don't exist. People and capital and ideas and money flow to cross the borders as if they are not there. I cannot even think of one border in Africa which is in a logical place. And, and uh, the, the data revolution is assisting with the fading out of these borders. Remember, farmers love this tendency because we want more open trade amongst the various countries. We want better access to, to each other and to technologies. That's why we are pushing so hard for cross-border value chain development. It lifts our businesses out of the petty politics of individual countries. Um, but, but, but we really need some advice as to the, the, the technical stuff behind it. How to dig that mine? What equipment to use? We have this one opportunity to lay a solid foundation. In four or five years from now, the building would be completed and you'll have to demolish all of it to get back to the foundation. That is why when I heard about the discussion today, <laughs> the first thing I said to my colleagues in PAFU, it, it is so timelessly, it's nearly too late. Thank you. I have to close the session now. One last thought, which did not come up. You know, data is a perishable commodity. Think about that. If it gets outdated, if it is not recent, it loses its value. It must be recent. It must be up to date. It must be fresh. So thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you for the interpreters to stay with us. Isolina, Michael, you want to... Michael, uh, your last word. You are the boss here. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. I think the audience is a boss in this condition. Um, we all thank you for being with us until quite late uh, this evening. This is the first time, actually, that we have uh, run the Brussels briefings in the evening, in the afternoon. Well, I think there is a lot of uh, key messages coming out of this discussion. We, we, we know that it's not as simple as the title suggests. Uh, there is a whole issue of the formal national st statistical system that's important for decision making and that's being used for policy uh, decisions both locally inter and, and in internationally that needs to be uh, reinforced and, and, and improved. Uh, but also on the other side there is a whole lot of uh, uh, opportunities from the technologies that are making things easily uh, accessible and uh, uh, facilitates generation and availability of data. So it's how we bring those things together to help uh, farmers make decisions at the small, you know, at, at the micro level, and also for governments to make appropriate decisions that support uh, agriculture at the national level. So we have heard a lot, and I think we, uh, I'm sure we'll ca we can continue these discussions. From our perspective, uh, one of the priority areas that we want to focus on in the coming few years in our revised strategy will be how we can facilitate capacity building and, and helping in this whole uh, data management issue, especially for our uh, partners like the regional farmers organizations, how we can help them to strategize and make better use of, uh, of the data available. So we welcome uh, opportunities for partnership and advice from uh, institutions that are working in this area. Uh, so I, I don't really intend to uh, I mean, add any more. I know you are all tired. You have all heard the key messages. I just would like to thank you uh, for your uh, attendance and the speakers, especially for doing a lot of work um, coming up with very interesting case studies and, and uh, very interesting insights 
into this issue. This has really enriched our discussions. So I very much like to thank you all and uh, of course the chairs for uh, leading the different sessions. Thank you very much and have a nice evening.